Selamat pagi Pak Jati, Pak Suardi, Pak Ardi. Selamat pagi juga. Pagi Pak Andre, Pak Jati ya. Enggak rekon, Andre. Ini lagi rekon, Pak. Iya, ini juga rekon ini di mana nih? <laughs> on on laptop aja, Pak. <laughs> Wah ini habis habis dari rekon ke balik papan nih. Balik papan. Pak Jati ke balik papan nih. Wah oh, iya. Pak Andri nggak diundang. Saya tinggalnya di Makassar Pak. Oh gitu sama saya juga diundang di Makassar di mana di balik papan rekon. Jangan di balik papannya Pak. Pak <laughs> ayah ayah wae. Ya, ya, si Pak Rudin kenapa mundur ya? Padahal kan sama aja. Daeng Adri kan juga lagi rekor, nggak mundur juga. Ya. Ya mungkin pakai gigi mundur pak. Kalau saya pakai gigi maju.
Halo, Assalamualaikum semuanya. Hello, good morning, Professor Rap. Ah, uh, good morning. <laughs> well, good afternoon from here. <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> in Indonesia it's morning. <laughs> nice to meet you, Professor Rap. Good morning, Sam Arif. Hello, good morning, Pak Jati. Uh, excuse me, uh, Professor Rap. I will to yes. say in Indonesia first. Uh, Oke, okay. teman-teman, habis ini kita mulai jam 8. Mbak Dona uh, sedang on the way ke kantor. So, we will start at 8 o'clock. Uh, and the Professor Rap is first speaker. So we start at uh, we start at 8 p.m. Professor Rap. Yes. Okay. Three minutes from now. Okay. Right. Yes. We will uh, with the participant. So should I um, share my screen now? Um, yes, yes. Okay, let me. Right. Okay, good. Good. Mm, yes. Yes, this is excellent uh, material, strong ground motion. Wow. This is good. <laughs> it's, it's, it's what affects us when we have an earthquake, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um. Okay, the time is 8 a.m. Okay, we'll start it. Uh, maybe I will open this session. And Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, all participants, and good morning. Uh, let me introduce uh, Professor. Uh, my name is Hakim. I am the moderator of today this course. And And then I hope the participants are still enthusiastic about attending this course in the second day, <laughs> because the material from the professor Arculeta is uh, very, very good. <laughs> And the course on this day, we have uh, some agenda. The agenda is we have the four uh, presentation. First, we will see and listen the presentation from Professor Rab Arculeta with the title is strong ground motion and uh, professor arculeta is a uh, professor of earth science at the university of california at the santa barbara right yes yeah okay his research interests uh, are observing analyzing and predicting strong motion from earthquake uh, okay maybe And the second session from Dr. Chris Parker, uh, who talk about subduction zone ground motion. And the third presentation is from Dr. Walter Mooney with the presentation about uh, seismicity of Indonesia. And last presentation or speaker from Mrs. Odisha Sativa and Mr. Adrian Yuji Octantio from PMTG. Okay. No, 
allow me to welcome the speaker, Professor Rab Arguleta, to deliver his presentation. You have uh, 60 minutes to talk, and you can finish at nine o'clock. Then we will continue to discussion for the presentation for about 15 minutes. Okay, Professor, uh, time is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Um, so I want to I want to thank uh, my good friend Walter for inviting me to participate in this training course, and um, I hope to make this somewhat interesting to you about strong ground motion and some of the effects and what we see in strong ground motion that makes it very difficult to make predictions all the time about what's going to happen during an earthquake. So. You know, you look at earthquake damage and some of it is, uh, you know, very, very, you know, TV oriented or movie oriented, you know, I mean, the idea that, you know, California could fall off and or something like this. This is, of course, San Francisco following the 1906 earthquake. And it's a drawing, but uh, it, it may be more realistic than you think. And then, of course, they're just crazy things, you know, schools being swallowed by cracks, et cetera, et cetera. No, the real damage, though, is just as frightening. And as Professor Mori showed yesterday in, during the Kobe earthquake uh, in Japan, you know, you have this, the Hanshin Highway be, basically being toppled for maybe two kilometers, you know, falling on its side. It's well engineered, it still cracks. At the same time, in Kobe on Awisha Island here, you have the fault going right next to this, you know, two story house and basically no damage. And we see that a lot of times. We see damage like what we found in Chi Chi with where the fault goes across, it destroys a bridge. It generates basically a scarp that's on the order of seven or eight meters high and you get a nice waterfall in a river. At the same time, you know, Landers was a magnitude 7.3 earthquake and it ruptured right by this house. It's not a very strong house or anything like that, but you know, almost no damage. And there, I like this one uh, taken in 1954. This scarp height is about three meters high. And yet at the same time, this old hut out here, you know, basically didn't even apparently know that there was an earthquake. But then you find something like what happens in, in Turkey in 1999, in which around this uh, mosque, There's one apartment building left. All the rest of that are basically demolished buildings, apartment buildings. And we could talk later. It's, a, it's very interesting as to why the minaret stood up with a narrow structure like this, strong shaking to knock down apartments. And yet here you have standing um, something that quite unexpected. The mosque itself is, we would expect, nice circular shape, et cetera. But the minaret, a little bit interesting. And again, you know, you look at San Francisco after the 1906 earthquake, and you see an incredible amount of damage. Um, large part of it is due to the earthquake. A large part of it is due to the Army Corps of Engineers dynamiting block by block to try stopping the fire that followed the earthquake. And but then on the lower picture, you can see, you know, a beautiful picture of San Francisco today, and you know, sitting on the San Andreas Fault. So we have to look then at, at ground motion from earthquakes and ask, well, what, what leads to all this um, sometimes severe destruction, sometimes not? Now, when we look at earthquakes, I mean, if you go into a seismology course, the first thing you learn about, and I'm sure that uh, I missed uh, Professor Ebel's presentation yesterday, but I'm sure he went over the idea that you look at a point source, okay? And the point source emits P waves and S waves, And we think of ground motion as, uh, you know, in seismology, so many people who have studied it, you know, looked at earthquakes because they're so far away, they're at teleseismic distances, they separate them into P and S waves and different types of P waves and different types of S waves and surface waves. And, and that, that makes a lot of sense if you view it as a single point source where all the energy comes from a point. But that is unlike what really happens in ground motion. In ground motion, and I have deliberately buried the scales both in time and, and amplitude, what you really have to think about when you think about strong ground motion and when you're close to the fault is simply amplitude as a function of time. 
I'm not saying what the time scale here. I mean, this could be recorded at teleseismic distances. We would know that this is the P wave by definition, but can anyone say whether or not this is really the S wave or is this really R1, the first Rayleigh wave that's traveled to the station? And then back in here, you have R2 coming in because it went the opposite way around the world. Or is this a local earthquake where this is P and this is S? But in ground motion, when you're close to the fault, as I will demonstrate, the ground motion cannot be separated into simple P and S waves. So you have to think of the ground motion that you're analyzing as something that is amplitude versus time. And a really good example of this is, is this station 10, um, pump station 10 is three kilometers off the fault, the Denali earthquake in 2000. It's a magnitude 7.9. And the ground motion that you have, the thing I want to point out, first of all, is that you have three components of ground motion. So you're, when you're talking about ground motion, it's not just you're going to be shaking in one direction. Your whole you know, structure is going to be moving in all three dimensions. The amplitudes are large in terms of, of acceleration. But again, this station is about 85 kilometers away from where the hypocenter is, but I'll show in a moment how the rupture came towards it, okay? And, but the ground motion can go on, you know, the strong part of the ground motion you might say is in here, you know, 20 to 40 seconds long. That's because of directivity effects, but it still continues, you know, 60 seconds of, of shaking, you know, that, that's, you know, 5% G or so, but large amplitudes can occur. And this station was sitting over here on uh, the Trans-Alaska Trans Pipeline. It's a, it's a station over in here. And this earthquake occurred on the Denali Fault and then later ruptured onto the Tushunta Fault. This is one point, okay? And it represents you know, only one point about what is happening in an earthquake that is basically about 300 kilometers long. And you, you have to wonder, okay, what did the rest of Alaska feel, you know, during the shaking? Because we don't have stations everywhere. Well, there's a lot of work going on now for doing numerical simulations of, of earthquakes. And it gives a better idea sometimes of how, you know, you might expect large variability in where the ground shaking is intense, where it's not intense, and the like. And I'd like to show this uh, video, or it's a, it's a video from uh, Rob Graves at the USGS uh, in a shakeout. It's a magnitude 7.8 earthquake on the San Andreas Fault. And it's going to start down in here. You'll see it as bright colors. And the colors indicate the overall amplitude of the particle of the ground velocity. And you see it with, you know, as the rupture proceeds up the fault, you see the large energy amplified in the forward direction, but do you see the waves are radiating out? You see reverberations back here in the Coachella Valley. You see it come up as it hits into the San Gabriels and you see this uh, refraction basically as the waves get trapped into the big basins of LA. And then it continues to rupture. The, the, the waves continue, the rupture stopped right here. But you see in the LA basin, this is also in the Oxnard basin, what you find then is basically reverberations that continue you know, seconds and minutes after the earthquake has actually stopped. And, and so it's like your bathtub is sloshing, but, but the ground motion can be intense everywhere, not just on the fault. The big thing about when you look at um, the ground motion that occurs you know, from an earthquake where you have really strong ground motion is that you have to remember, first of all, that the source of the elastic waves is a finite fault, okay? The hypocenter and the epicenter, they always, you know, the epicenter always gets plotted in the newspapers because you can plot those things on a map. Nothing in, in the, you know, in, with regard to the earthquake source, nothing is happening there actually. Um, it's at the hypocenter that the earthquake initiates. And then from, from there, it, it spreads out across some finite area, all the time releasing energy, elastic strain energy that's released in the form of these elastic waves. And the ground motion that we feel are these elastic waves that are coming off, but every point on the fault is emitting P and S waves, okay? So the energy is coming off and, and you get P and S waves, but now 
the ground motion is going to be the accumulation of all of these different parts of the fault radiating at different times and different places. And so depending where you are relative to this fault, it can really affect what the ground motion will be. And, you know, we, 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 we use this form, uh, you know, the representation theorem, uh, is, which is a convolution basically of slip on the fault and, and the Green's functions basically on the fault. And I'll come back to this a little bit more in a different way to look at this. So mathematically you represent this and you say, okay, I've got this, this overall idea of I've got slip on the fault, I've got these Green's functions. The important thing here though, to remember is that this double integral means that you're integrating everything over the entire fault plane. So the ground motion at some point X is in fact the result of everything that's occurring on the fault. And then you have the integration over time. And so what you have is a convolution between basically slip at some point on the fault and Green's functions, or basically you know, the relationship of the, how that energy is transmitted from a point on the fault to a point at, at your station. And you end up having you know, this sort of integration over the space and an integration over time. And this is what's leading to the ground motion that you see at some point. But you've got N here is only one component of ground motion and you've got all three components of ground motion. And so you look at something at, uh, let's say this is the, from the Chuetsu earthquake in 2004, stationed fairly close to the fault. And the idea is that again, the ground motion here, uh, sorry, is all three components of ground motion. And so at any given time, you, you have to ask yourself, how am I going to explain all three components? How do I explain this great, this large amplitude that's coming in here, which clearly when I integrate, it's gonna have a large velocity. How does that relate basically to the velocity that when, if I integrate in here is going to lead to large ground velocity? And the accelerations are large. In other words, this is a type of ground motion that can cause damage because you're looking at something that's more than a half a G. This one is actually more than one G, okay? So when you're looking at this, then the, all three components of ground motion are being generated by the fault. But it's hard to imagine, you know, when you're looking at this, you know, just exactly how this is gonna work and how it's going to play out. So, a different way to look at that representation theorem, which is very succinctly put right here. Now, this paper by O'Connell et al, I will strongly recommend to you and I will have it in the references at the end um, and it's available online for free, but it's one of the very best reviews of, of strong ground motion estimates that I've ever seen. And, but it gives an idea here. So I took this from there and what they show is that you know, you, you have the fault plane and you have different parts of the fault plane that have different amounts of stress or, or strain energy release. And then at the same time, it's all being coordinated by some rupture front that is propagating irregularly and at different speeds across the fault. And all that leads to basically saying, you know, if you do this from a mathematical point of view, you're taking the slip velocity at a point on the fault you're gonna convolve it with the site greens function for that particular place on the fault. And then you're gonna start adding this up over time. And you keep adding and adding and adding and different points on the fault are leading to different, different um, ground motion. So you get this point gives you this, another point on the fault gives you this, they're all being convolved, but now you're adding all this ground motion together because it's all going to end up in, your, in the overall ground motion that you experience at a site. And of course it's complicated. And so it's very, very hard to predict because we have no idea. What we don't have any idea of is what does the, what would we look at for the release of energy on the fault? In other words, what is the stress change on, at every point on the fault? We have no idea what that really looks like. And so we have a very, very hard time making a prediction about what the ground, a specific ground motion at a specific piece of time would look like. And so I'm not gonna, don't read these and don't, I'm not gonna go through them. This is in the paper by Dan O'Connell and others. 
And I strongly recommend that you take a look at this because they give a very clear idea of the different factors that are affecting the amplitude of the ground motion, as well as the timing at which you're going to get, you know, how the timing is affected by the uh, different parts of the fault, different, different issues with regard to how the rupture is propagating and how the waves are propagating. But there's a different way to look, and they mentioned this in the paper by O'Connell, that there's a better way to look in some ways at, at ground motion. And it's what's called the isochrone representation of ground motion. Now the isochrones were introduced by Pascal Bernard and Raoul Mandariaga in, in 1984 to look at the starting and stopping phases. Spudich and Frazier simultaneously produced this paper in BSSA in 1984, but they looked at as, as the rupture would propagate across the fault. And what I like about their uh, presentation is that it gives a very good idea of the factors that are important in generating your ground motion, the over here, the acceleration, for example. And one of them, one of the first terms, and so the isochrone is this line Y, and I'm gonna get to this in a moment just to explain what that is but it's a line on the fault, okay? And you're integrating all the way around that line on the fault, and you're adding up the terms, these four terms. And the first term is stress drop, which a lot of people know, and, and they would say, okay, it's the stress drop that's driving it. Well, that's part of what contributes to your acceleration. There's also a spatial derivative of the Green's function, which is generally close to zero, so you don't worry about it. And this value of C is called the isochrone velocity. And I'll show you in, in graphically what that is. And then there is a, the, this very important term in here is a change in isochrone velocity or the acceleration of the isochrone front. This can be very large because this is related uh, to the rupture velocity. And the rupture velocity acts like a massless particle shown by SLB uh, a long time ago, 1959 or so, and, and so dc by dt can be, can change, it could be infinite. In other words, it doesn't require, it, since it doesn't have any inertial term, it can change in, in, a, in a microsecond. So you can get a very large term in, you know, contribution from this. And there's also curvature of the isochrone. When the, when the isochrone hits a boundary or something, you get a, 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 a wave that, you know, contributes. And so let me, let me show, sort of show you graphically what this means, okay? So the isochrone is the loci of points on a fault that radiate elastic waves that arrive at a station at the same time. So any point when you're looking at ground motion at a station, it's recorded. And you look at some instant in time, you could, what you're looking for then is what you'd like to know is what is the isochrone that contributed to that amplitude at that particular station. And so each station has a distinct isochrone time. It's, it's not the same at every station because the, the rupture time on the fault, let's suppose that we have a constant rupture velocity as here, we have two different stations. The travel time is different because now what you do is just put here and let's suppose it's a homogeneous medium, you just get circular arcs. You add those together and you get the isochrone time. And the thing about it is that you, you can see here at this station, you know, the isochrones are here, then they're fairly uniform, not much happening, okay? Here, you can see that basically there are large accelerations. These are jumping, they're equal in time. Here, you know, that dc by dt is zero because there's nothing happening. So you might get something from the stress if it's heterogeneous on the fault, but nothing else. But the isochrone itself is, is really changing in here. So the isochrone velocity is, is small in here, very large in here, as well as the acceleration as it jumps from here to here, jumps from here to here, then decelerates. So you have these contributions that will end up contributing to the ground motion. And so this ground motion we're looking at, when we look at this, the, the individual points, these are all coming basically, if you can imagine, this line on the fault that's moving across the fault as it's radiating, okay? And there's some width to it as well, so, but it just complicates the facts. So here is an example of an isochrone and the contribution, okay? So the solid black line is acceleration. This is all computed numerically. 
And you can see when you get at this station, you get a very large, you know, more than 200 centimeters per second squared, more than point, uh, you know, 20% of G. Here you're seeing basically that you, you get something, it's, it's going, it's fairly large. It's not quite as large, You've, it's uniform rupture and uniform stress. And so you're, you're getting this, and then you continue down the fault, you'll get different, you get different contributions. The contribution part of it is that you decay things because of one over R, you attenuate the amplitude. That's why it's, it's not just, just the isochrone itself, it's you're farther away than what you were at this station, you're, you're twice the distance at this one. So one over R is cutting down the amplitude, but at the same time, you've got more acceleration. So there are trade-offs between the attenuation, the geometrical attenuation, which I'll talk about later, and what you would see basically in, in the, um, due to the isochrone itself. Now, one of the things that Jan Schmiedes and I found out, and which was interesting to us, is that, that what you get is a saturation over here. In other words, that the, the motion doesn't keep growing and growing and growing, uh, you know, which some people would expect from directivity. No, the motion saturates. In other words, your, your peak ground velocity reaches a maximum basically at around 40 kilometers length. Now, this is only for a fault that's width is limited to 15 kilometers depth. It could be very different if you're if the depth of um, seismicity or the strain energy being released goes to 20 kilometers or 25 kilometers to the surface and the like. But it does give a reason why you see, as what we saw yesterday with Professor Mori, that you see saturation as you see between magnitude, um, let's say six and a half to seven. And the, the number comes out, basically, it starts to saturate around magnitude 6.8 for these crustal earthquakes. But the, the, the thing about it is that the isochrones give you an idea and they tell you that every station is different because they will see a different isochrone time and how it evolves over time. So the, um, one of the things that you, know, you find, and it's been around for years, um, it goes back to um, Benioff, Hugo Benioff in the study of the 1952 California earthquake, that you get rupture directivity. And, and what it is, is the idea that if you have a moving point source, it's moving in this direction. And so you're radiating at these little black dots, each one radiates, let's say an S wave, okay? But the rupture is moving with a speed that is close to the S wave. Then what will happen is that in the forward direction, the waves don't separate by much in time, okay? So when they arrive at a station, you're getting all that energy is compact in this direction. And so you're stacking up these wavelets, let's say, and you get a large amplitude in the forward direction. In the backward direction, the opposite has occurred. These little wavelets are spread out as it moves away from, the, from, the, from your observer. And so in the opposite direction, you will get something that looks like this, which would be, you know, this is a cartoon, but it shows basically that the amplitude will be uh, smaller. The overall displacement, the integral underneath this, this curve is the same, but it's the idea of what is directivity doing for you. Now, the directivity, you know, the, um, John, I'm sure showed this yesterday, you know, that, you, you know, you've got radiation patterns for point sources. Okay. But now suppose you have a moving point source. Okay. And this is what would happen then if you have the rupture velocity over the shear wave velocity is 0.5. This is the rupture velocity over the shear wave velocity 0.9. Most earthquakes are in the range of let's say 0 0.7 to 0 0.9. And what you see is a, that in the S wave, there is a huge amplification and, and, it's, and there's a big change in scale. This is already amplified basically about a factor of two for rupture velocity that's 0 0.5 times the shear wave speed. But when you're about 0 0.9, it's more than five. And so you're really looking at, at very, very large directivity. In other words, the, the amplitude of the S wave in that direction. And this is the S wave radiation pattern that you're going to see on the perpendicular to strike. Okay. And so what will happen is that the large amplitude you expect then to be on fault normal. And this is exactly what has been observed. One of the clearest examples is the fault normal velocity in the case of the Imperial Fault, 
1979 earthquake, magnitude 6.6. .6. It starts here south of the border and then propagates in, in a northwesterly direction. It actually bifurcates onto the Brawley Fault as well. But as you can see, there was a, a wonderful USGS array across the fault, these stations through here, okay? And this is the fault normal component. And you see fairly small at Bonds Corner, but once it gets up here where you're, where you're near the, the center of the fault and moving on, you can see this large amplitude. This station is actually on this side of the fault. You see this fault normal is very, very large. And, and about 115 centimeters per second. And this is due to the directivity of this unilateral rupture. And, but there've been other, and, and uh, uh, Professor Mori showed some yesterday that was taken from a paper by Hall and others. And I have a copy of that here, but uh, just show the other one that Steve Hartzell and I showed in 1981, when we were looking at ground motion, what to expect. And you could see in Parkfield in 1966, this large pulse, these are all on the fault normal. Pacoima had a fault, nor Pacoima Dam, the fault normal, it sits on the hanging wall. You can get directivity up dip in a thrust fault. Gilroy six is a small earthquake, Coyote Lake. And then these were the two large ones that came from El Centro uh, station six and seven in 1979. Well, the measure, you know, when we talk about the size of an earthquake, and, and almost everyone knows this, you know, that the magnitude is one measure, and, and it really measures the relative size of an earthquake. The absolute size of an earthquake was, was that, was a, uh, the, the method is to use seismic moment uh, following Aki 1966. And there's a relationship uh, derived um, basically, well, derived by H Tom Hanks and Hiro Kanemori, 1979, where they, they defined a way to define the moment and to put log moment relative to moment magnitude. Now, Kanemori had already devised the energy magnitude that you see much more commonly today. Um, um, I think it's because bold M is not easily transmitted and MW is, but it's bias. But anyhow, I think that you will find that there, the magnitude is moment magnitude, and it's based on, on the absolute size of an earthquake. And the idea here is that I would mention that in most of the NGA relationships, most of the relationships that you find for ground motion prediction equ uh, equations use bold M. That's not true. It depends where you are. But certainly in the United States, it's been the, 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 the standard for years to use moment magnitude for the magnitude. And there's a reason for having to want a, a moment magnitude or something that depends on, on the moment because that is absolute measurement of the size of an earthquake and it will not saturate. But these, I'm not gonna go into why you know, they, these saturate, but there are problems with when you get above magnitude seven using other magnitudes because they don't tend to capture the full size of an earthquake, especially for the very largest ones like a magnitude nine. But if you look at magnitude and let's say ground motion and you ask yourself, well, how much of an effect is it? It is not what, what you're going to get you know, from the Richter magnitude scale. And that is that you would expect an amplitude, you know, a factor of 10 increase <coughs> with every increase in magnitude. When you're in close to the fault, where you have a finite fault, you, you, you don't as, um, you know, Professor Mori mentioned yesterday and, and also Dr. Parker mentioned, you don't see the entire fault, okay? So what happens is that these, the scaling is, as you get to these bigger earthquakes, you're too far away to see all that amplitude, all that energy is not condensed at a point. You're not going to see it scale by factors of 10. And this very, very nice uh, graph uh, comes from the Guerrero Ray in Mexico, showing a magnitude 3.1 all the way to a magnitude 8.1. But even if you look at a seven to eight, you don't see a factor of 10 in the amplitude. And they're all at about the same hypocentral distance. So you're not seeing a factor 10. What you do see, of course, what is really different is the duration of the strong earthquake and the strong shaking. 
Now you're getting 40, you know, 40 seconds of strong shaking. Magnitude five and a half, you might see, you know, strong shaking over, you know, three or four seconds. So where the real difference comes in, in the magnitude and what you would expect with strong ground motion is the duration of strong, of, of strong shaking. I wanna talk about some of the factors that really affect, you know, what you have to think about. And one of the most important is geometrical attenuation, one over R. And, and basically, this is what you would expect if waves are expanding from some point on the fault. So any point on the fault that's radiating, that energy that's being radiated from that point on the fault is going to decrease like one over R. There, there are other complications with the, the path, but the biggest effect is this. And, you know, typical measure of, of, you know, PGA or something like this from an earthquake, you use the regression, you know, the GMPEs. This comes from Bohr and Atkinson's 2008 GMPE done um, routinely at the Strong Motion Center. And what you see, <coughs> you know, their, their GMPE, okay, ground motion. But I draw on here a line that's simply one over R. And, and if you do this with most of the GMPEs, I found that, you know, for most of the distance out to, uh, when you get out to 50 kilometers or so, most of it decays like one over R. It's, it's almost as good a fit as, as this blue line. It may not fit out here, <coughs> but where the amplitude really matters, when you're talking about amplitude that can cause damage, when you're above a 10th of a G, for example, that this, this in fact, might be decaying more like one over R and you, it may not be so complicated. It's a may, and this is something that's universal. I mean, it, amplitudes are going to decrease in this way. Now you can have the amplitude. I wanted to show this slide because you know, you also in the path, you have an inelastic attenuation. And typically that's, that's represented by something like E to the minus omega T over two Q and this is the type of amplification that you would expect to see, uh, you know, over as it moves along. But you've also got one over R is always happening. And I would point out that, you know, you know, for low frequencies, one over R is the dominant. So if you were looking at something like one hertz, uh, one over R is really killing the amplitudes much faster than the attenuation due to one hertz. And this is with a very low Q. Q in the earth can be, uh, in crustal rocks can be much higher than this uh, for Q beta. So the idea here is to show that in the static field decays even, even more quickly, one over R squared. But the one over R is a strong attenuator and that has to be considered. Now, of course, at high frequencies, you're gonna combine both the 10 Hertz. So you're gonna decrease both, you know, down let's say 30% here and down by a factor of 10. But the biggest contributor by the time you've gotten 10 kilometers from wherever that energy was radiated, the biggest contributor is geometrical attenuation. Until you get out to more distant uh, you know, places. In addition to the, this term that we talk about with the path effect, there's also a local site effect where a lot of people put a lot of attention. You'll see this a lot in the GMPEs. People put a lot of attention in, as what they call kappa but it's really kappa zero. I should have put a zero in here because what they're talking about is the kappa at zero distance. In other words, what is the local site effect? And what I wanted to point out is that if you use kappa, you know, somewhere around 0 0.04, which is not unusual in the NGA relations in, in the United States, sometimes a 0 0.03, but the curve would drop like that. But if you said, well, where is this one over E? that's 0.37, you'd find basically that you get the F max that Tom Hanks talks about that's due to a side effect somewhere around eight Hertz. So they're, they're related, but attenuation, you know, these for, especially for PGA, this makes a big difference because that's related to the high frequencies. As you get to the lower frequencies that might be driving peak velocity, then in fact, you might be looking at a, at a different situation. Well, the thing about ground motion is that, you know, you think that, okay, I have two stations that are close and you, we see this in the, in the ground motion prediction, you know, all the data, all the time. 
You get two stations at the same distance and they have wildly different or vastly different PGA and sometimes very different PGV. So this was a magnitude 7.1 earthquake. Uh, it's on a thrust fault. These two stations are separated by, by on the order of five kilometers or less, actually, they're about, about seven uh, or six kilometers, maybe a little bit more. But if you look at the ground motion at the Petrolia station, you can see that it, it's at 1G, whereas the ground motion over here is 0.6. And likewise, you, know, you get 1.5G you know, coming in on this pulse and a much smaller amplitude you know, on the same component at, at Petrolia. So the, the ground motion can vary over a small distance. It's not like, um, you know, that you're um, looking at, um, you know, you can say, well, I'm close to each other, so I should expect the same ground motion. Now, there are reasons for this. Uh, David and I would argue that this is a source effect in a, in a very particular way, because there's no other way to really explain. Um, we, we could not find another way to explain how you could get such a large difference. And it has to do with how the isochrones line up to make the station Cape Mendocino receive an intense amount of energy in a short period of time. Whereas that same, at that same time, remember, Petrolia has an isochrone, but it's a different one. And that isochrone is very different. And so you get amplitude, but you don't get as much focusing in a sense off the isochrone as you get it at Cape Mendocino station. Now we have seen this in, uh, in other cases, okay? Um, one of the most famous cases is Pacoima Dam 1971, which recorded 1.25G. And Pacoima Dam recording 1.25G was, um, it was considered heresy, in other words, to the engineers, because if you look at the history of PGA, I mean, there was a belief at one time that it could not exceed, you know, even 10% G. There was a very good study by, or article by Ambrazes pointing out that how it evolved over time. But Pacoima Dam in 1971 had 1.75 G. Well, everybody thought that that could be a topographic effect. It's on the left abutment and it's high in a valley. And so CDMG and the USGS instrumented this. And then we had the 1994 Northridge earthquake, same magnitude roughly. And what happened is that we don't have the, um, we can see what the ground motion looks like. But the nice thing about this was that they also put one downstream. So this is about three kilometers away from the dam downstream on a hard rock site. And, and again, when you look at Northridge, Again, you find very large ground motion, you know, 1.3 G, 1.6 G on the left abutment. The up, it, it's in fact larger than what we had in San Fernando. But if you go downstream, then what happens is that you do see that the amplitude is, you know, it, it's greatly reduced, factors of three to five. And so what happens is that, yes, small differences and location can make a big difference in what PGA is because it's, it's related to the high frequency components of ground motion, but can cause an enormous amount of damage. Well, so what's going on? Part of it is topogra you know, topography, you know, Pacoima Dam is obviously in a valley and, and in the mountain area. But then we were looking, you know, the other big effect in ground motion is the side effect. And so I wanted to show, you know, here are two stations I show them as red dots. They're really close to this magnitude 6.7 earthquake in year 2000, the Tatori earthquake. And, and what we're going to see then, these two stations have our kick net stations where they have instruments that are 100 meters below ground. And lo and behold, if you look at these, they're both about the same epicentral distance. And what you find then is that, you know, the, the red are always the surface ground motion. They're oriented in exactly the same direction. And you can see this very large amplification as you come to the surface. And that's because you are, in fact, you're conserving energy. You have a lower shear modulus. You have the same amount of energy. The amplitude goes up. And, you know, the, um, Fabian Bonilla, Fabrice Coton, Catherine Berish, 
they, they did a very nice study and there've been other studies to follow with the KickNet data because the KickNet data is the one where you have borehole records and you also have um, uh, the surface record at the same site. So you can see the difference between surface and borehole. And what you can see is that if you look at something like PGA, you know, you're, you're starting off where basically it's a factor of almost 10 larger than what you would get at depth. Now it doesn't follow a nice linear curve. It, it cuts over and, and things like this, but overall you are still seeing, you know, some factor, you know, as you, as you increase, you know, factors of four to five, even as you get to larger amplitude, okay? This is spectral acceleration. You can see that if you go to the spectral acceleration, when you get to the, the longer periods, you almost see a one-to-one -one relationship. So you don't, it's a frequency dependent amplification. That's why PGA is not always the best indicator of how, the total amplification, because you have to look at it at frequencies. You can't just simply say it's going to be whatever the PGA ratio is. You have to look to see what period is most most important to the structure you're, you're interested in um, you know, designing or, or preserving. Well, the argument's always been um, um, that basically you will get nonlinearity, that nonlinearity on, will, in, on soil sites will, will basically eliminate the chance of large accelerations. And so basically, you, you, basically what this says is on a soil site, you're, you're expected never to get much above a half a G, but, but that's not really always the case. Now, a large part of this comes from the idea, which is the typical idea of what happens in nonlinearity, where you get to liquefaction, that you see the high, you know, high ground motion coming in, this on Treasure Island in the Loma Prieta earthquake, then at this point it liquefies and basically nothing, okay? On a rock site that's you know, very close by, you see the high frequencies keep propagating right on through and you don't see any sign and the amplitude is lower and you don't see any sign of, of nonlinearity. But you can in fact get nonlinearity from what happens to be a, a, um, a liquefaction, almost a liquefaction type behavior called cyclic mobility, in which case, in this case, in Bond's corner, the PGA is in fact due to cyclic mobility. It's due to a nonlinear effect that occurs that occurs in the um, in the, in the in the soil, and this happens in a lot of places where you have soils that are are in uh, soft soils that have a lot of water in them. So these this very characteristic sort of pulse is very characteristic of what is called cyclic mobility. And you can see that a lot in, in strong ground motion. Well, coming close to the end in here, but I wanted to talk to you about, you know, the, this uh, earthquake, the 2008 Iwati Miyagi magnitude 6.9 earthquake. And uh, Professor Mori talked about it yesterday um, because it has this, this station IWTH 25, okay, which is a kick net station, okay? So we've got ground motion at the surface and ground motion at depth. And there has been an enormous amount of effort uh, to explain this vertical record, which approaches almost 4G and the, you know, the vertical ground motion. And, you know, it's, Jim talked about it and I'm not going to go into that. I think it's what, what to me is, and I've done a lot of work with borehole work, uh, borehole instruments and the like. What is really uh, uh, astounding is when you look at the ground motion at depth, because at depth, we're seeing ground motion that's 100 meters down, basically, that we're seeing ground motion that is on the order of a half a G, which is extremely unusual. At the surface, this is 10, so this is 1G. These are 1G levels. At the surface, you're going to find, if you cut across here, just draw a horizontal line, you will find basically more than 10 or 12 peaks that are above 1G. And if you add the bottom ones, you basically double that. So at the surface, this, this station was really interesting. And, um, you know, but the ground motion here from this earthquake was extremely rich in high frequencies and really very, very intense shaking. 
this earthquake is, is one that is uh, very interesting in terms of the strength of the ground motion that was recorded. And, and so it's, it's, it's quite amazing. But interestingly, one, one month later, there was another earthquake, almost the same magnitude, but it was at a depth of 108 kilometers. And I wanna point out that the region of high intensity, there are places in here that are more than, what we're looking at is more than a half a G in these bright red, okay? Now, this is a, the same region, same place, but now we're 108 kilometers away. We're not sitting right on top of the fault. And so if you were to take an average of the four ground motion prediction equations in, in earthquake spectra, these are the NGA West uh, one equations, um, you would find basically that their prediction for, you know, for, this, for this earthquake would be something like this. But the data range here has to be out in here because you're 108 kilometers away. And these numbers in here range everywhere between this is one, you can't read it, but it's 1,019 gal, 716, 433. I gotta go back one. And so what the, these, the data out in here, you know, there are a huge amount of data showing that it far exceeds what you would ever have predicted from a, so you wanna be careful. This is why you don't wanna be mixing crustal NGA or, or ground motion prediction equations with Earth, with those that, as uh, Dr. Parker is talking about subduction, uh, because you can find a very different type of behavior. And but even if you look at uh, the Chuetsu earthquake, which is again um, a crustal earthquake, now again, I mean, you're looking at, at you know hypocentral distances of 11 to 23 kilometers or something like this, and the values of PGA are are above 1G. So you've got lots of data that can exceed the PGA. So sometimes you get an earthquake that is completely an outlier. And so when, says, when someone says, well, we're surprised by it, yeah, you have to be because it doesn't look like any other earthquake that, that we've seen in terms of what the you know, predicted ground motion would be as a function of distance. So let me summarize then um, the, the key things about in, when, you're, when you're looking at strong ground motion. First and foremost, you have to look at the earthquake source, okay? But you have to realize that this is a finite fault. It's a big fault. It's hundreds of kilometers long or 40 or 50 kilometers long, 30 kilometers deep, maybe 15, who knows? It's, a, it's still a large distance. And on that fault, you have heterogeneous stress drop. You have irregular rupture propagation. Both of those, as we see in the isochrone formulation, will contribute to the ground motion in a significant way. So that earthquake source by itself is the dominant, right? You have path effects, okay? Geometrical attenuation, you know it's gonna go like one over R roughly, and you can get some cusp and the rest. And you also have inelastic attenuation. The thing about inelastic attenuation, you can measure these sort of properties independent of the big earthquake. In other words, these are properties of, of the path, okay? So as long as the earth is not changing a lot, these properties are going to be uh, stationary over time. The same is true of side effects. In other words, you have amplification, you have, there is local attenuation, sometimes it's linear attenuation, sometimes it's nonlinear, but you also have side effects that are due to topography, like basins, mountains, and the edges of basins. And so all of these effects really lead to strong ground motion where you have to look at it as not looking at it as P waves and S waves, you have to start looking at it as, this is the ground motion that is coming about and I have to understand basically how is the amplitude going to vary in time? And we can get some straight, we can get some very large outliers, okay? But they are outliers in the sense that when you look on average, the ground motion prediction equations tend to capture, let's say the median response. But if you, if you have to worry about the outliers, then in, in, because you have a very critical structure, then you have to be a little bit more conservative in what you're going to willing to accept. And you cannot take something at face value knowing that these outliers exist, that there are data that would show you that they greatly exceed what would be 
you know, predicted from the median of the uh, ground motion prediction equations. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Professor Rob, uh, for giving us such informat uh, informative and interesting presentation. And then uh, looks like we still have 10 minutes for presentation, but no problem. Uh, maybe we will to discuss this presentation. And I have uh, one question from the chat column from Pa Andri. Pa Andri, are you uh, open mic? Hello, Pa Andri. Yeah. Uh, okay, I will do read the question. Okay, so, oh. so yes, the yes. chat, so yes. he asked uh, how to determine Q in a region? Yes, how the question, uh, yeah, the question is how to determine Q in a region. Uh, I think what is mean Q? Like, Q is, or, uh, yeah, Q the, the, the attenuation parameter Q is, is you can do this uh, by looking at two different stations that are, you know, that record a, um, let's say a small earthquake, because you know, let's suppose you get a nice, a well-recorded magnitude three and a half earthquake. Okay, now this, this does look like a point source. So you can identify the P wave and the S wave, and you can look then at how that propagates and attenuates with distance. Okay, so you can give, you can assign it a unit value at the source you know the distance and if you know the propagation paths, which is something you're going to need, but you propagate this and then you can look at and say, well, if I attend, well, how much is the S wave attenuated as I go between 20 kilometers and 50 kilometers, 50 to 100. And you can look, <coughs> you can look at the spectrum of that. Um, the, one way of doing is just looking at the amplitudes doing narrow band pass filters of different frequencies, and you can look at that as it decays with distance. Q could be frequency dependent, so the different uh, band passes will, will give you a different answer. But at the same time, you can determine then, because you have in, in your, you have the amplitude, and you have basically R over beta or some travel time. And so you can determine Q from that equation by itself. The other way that people will often try to determine Q is to take a point source and assume that the point source has a spectral shape, a Brun spe uh, uh, typically an omega to the minus two spectral shape. Well, an omega to the minus two spectral shape, if your high frequencies deviate from this spectrum, then you can in fact say, well, what do I need to correct back to it? And this is something that um, most people look at that in a, in a slightly different way. They use a method that was developed by uh, John Anderson and Sue Huff, 1984, in which they, they plot uh, basically the log amplitude and linear in frequency so that you can see if it's an exponential, then the amplitudes would decay as a straight line. And you can see what that decay is and then determine Q that would make it um, according to that. So there are different ways of getting it, but the nice thing about determining Q is that you can, determining, you can determine it without having to look at the really big earthquakes. You can, you can determine it from, which is generally a good assumption from smaller earthquakes, magnitude threes, which are on the order of a point source. In other words, they have small scale. And so the amplitudes you're looking for are, are, are you're not expected them to be affected by the finiteness of the fault. So it's that that's the way it would be done. How, oh, Bandri? It's clearly. Okay. It's clear. And the second. Oh, the second question from uh, Mr. Walter Mooney. Oh, hello, Mr. Walter Mooney. Yeah. Hello, Dr. Walter Mooney. Yeah. Yeah, so my question was, Ralph, uh, <laughs> should, the, should the first priority be to uh, determine GMPEs for Indonesia, or can they, can they get started with uh, existing GMPEs uh, in their ground motion estimations? My, my, okay, my general feeling is that um, 
let's ignore the subduction zone to begin with. Okay, let's look at, because as mentioned yesterday, a large number of the earthquakes, uh, are they crustal earthquakes? Okay. And not associated with the, subduct with the subduction directly. Okay. In other words, they could be in the depth range over which you have the, the interplate earthquakes. But if you have earthquakes that are in the, in the crust, um, then my feeling is, is that, yes, my feeling is, is that the crustal um, earthquakes could be used by the NGA West 2, for example. NGA West 2 is simply an extension of NGA West 1, but to smaller magnitudes so that it would extrapolate correctly as you went to smaller magnitudes. They didn't affect what was happening in the larger ones. So the bigger earthquakes, the magnitude um, sixes, let's say, and sevens, you know, the NGA West um, would, I think, would apply because I don't think that you would, see, you know, it's not like you're looking, you're looking at an area that has active tectonics. And that's, that's the data that went into the crustal parts of NGA uh, West too. Right. Even though right. they were, they, they used earthquakes as long as it was active tectonics. And so I, I would say that in active, clearly Indonesia falls into that category. I think the, the I would not, I'd be very careful about um, using NG, you know, I'd be very careful about using the NGA subduction until they are really sure how well, you know, which of the subduction zones is, is closest uh, to um, what is happening in Indonesia and look at the data that comes from that subduction zone. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Jim Mori has a question. Yes, okay. Um, Professor James Mori, you can yeah. open mic. <laughs> yeah, good talk, Ralph. Lots of very interesting examples. But I sort of, go away with a message that um, you're a little pessimistic about really being able to predict ground motion, especially for like a critical facility, like a nuclear power plant, which you have to look at very small probabilities. What do we as seismologists tell them about the potential ground motions? I mean, we look at the big picture and all these kind of interesting things that, um, that you show today. And basically we're saying, anything can happen. I mean, it's very hard to put a reasonable range that, that you want to apply to something that you know, has to be at the probabilistic values of you know, 1,000 years or 10,000 years or something like that. So as seismologists, what, do we, what kind of useful information do we really give the engineers of critical facilities? Well, I, I, I really think that the, it, it, I'm not that, quite that pessimistic. Um, my, my, my feeling about it is this, is that the, the ground motion um, that is, you know, when, when people do all the analysis uh, and they gather so much data from all the earthquakes, the assumption is, is that, okay, we have all of the data and it's all included in this, okay? And every now and then we get an earthquake that sort of falls outside of it. So in the sense of, in, their, in, the, in the way that they would analyze most of these uh, power plants in a probabilistic sense, they would say, okay, what is the probability that it's going to exceed something? And so the issue becomes, you know, how often do we see, let's say, a, a Chuetsu type earthquake where, where the ground, the PGAs all seem to be so much higher than what you would have expected. Uh, and, and, and the realization is that, yes, we could have that, but it's a matter of looking at what is the median and are the standard deviations that we that are assigned to it, are they, um, how do I put it? You, you, can't, you can't assign that standard deviation of, you know, one standard deviation or something like this. When you look at something that is a critical structure, you're going to have to make an estimate of, of how many standard deviations are you willing to allow for the ground motion that you're willing to accept. And this becomes just as you mentioned yesterday and your 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 colleague down the hall from you, you know, because you know, you 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 mention a factor of two to an engineer. That's crazy because the, the thing about it is that their their cost goes up by factors that are powers a 10 with that number, not, 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 that's why they want it 20% or 10% uh, because the cost of doing something goes up so much. 
But it, but at the same time, I don't think that people should sit back and say, okay, that we we that we can't have an outlier. In other words, if if you're always going to say I'm going to design for the worst possible case, then if you take the worst possible case happening anywhere in the world, it, it could be, it far exceed what you can design for. And, and I mean, so I think, I think that I, I would like to know why Chuetsu is such an outlier. I don't understand uh, enough about it to understand well why that earthquake is such an outlier in terms of the ground motion it, pro it produced. Uh, but, but you could get that type of ground motion you know, we're seeing that the average stress drop, you know, in earthquakes can vary. I mean, it's just a, a, a unfortunate, but you know, if the, if the if the average stress drop varies by a factor of three or four, you could in fact just on occasion just have that worst possible scenario. You don't have an average stress drop of three megapascals. You get a you get a stress drop of thirty or forty megapascals. You, get, you will generate some very, very large ground motion if most of the fault has that type of stress drop. Right, I mean, I think for most buildings, that's, that's good. I mean, if you're looking at buildings and there's you know, hundreds of thousands of them, well, if you're wrong one or two times, then that's, that's okay. But I think we have to think a little bit different about critical facilities where we don't have that luxury. We don't have a lot. We're talking about maybe you know, two or three and if you're wrong <laughs> out of that, then it's really a disaster. So yeah. it's, it's just a problem. I don't know what the answer is, but. No, uh, you're exactly right. That's why they, they look at these crazy things of, uh, you know, what is the, you know, not one in, in 2,500, which is a standard, uh, you know, sort of, um, you know, 1%, what is it? 1% in 50 years sort of thing. But they look at the idea of saying, okay, well, what is, what is it going to be if, you know, in 10,000 years? And that, but at the same time, the, you know, if you've got earthquakes close by or, or ground motion that's, you know, nearby, it's unlikely that, okay, somehow it's just going to change uh, when you have another earthquake in that region. In other words, I think the small earthquakes are indicative of what type of stresses are in the earth at that time. So you, it, it's just going to take a, a different way of thinking, I think, about, um, about how to handle critical structures. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Some questions in the chat box. Yes. Oh. Okay. Maybe Pa Andri, you can open mic. And this is a continue of a question before Pa Andri. Oh. Okay. Oh yes. Okay. So um, the question becomes. Uh, if you want to predict, you know, you know, ground motions, let's say on a, let's suppose you're doing it for a city <coughs> where you want to do, um, you know, you, you're zoning a, a, a metropolitan area and you'd like to know what the hazard is. Can you actually put in sensors that can tell you what the ground motion is going to be from, you know, over a small scale, let's say two kilometers or five kilometers. And again, my feeling is, is that yes, you can in the sense that, but you, you need to uh, do a very good job of estimating, first of all, what the subsurface velocity structure looks like, okay? Because then you're going to be looking to say, well, how much variability should I, I expect? These places which had the wide variability, you know, if you're, the thing about Petrolia and Cape Mendocino is both of those those particular sites happen to sit directly above the fault. And that leads to the possibility that you can have a different isochron uh, contribution from different parts of the fault. But if you're off the fault, you know, if you're away from the fault, then the radiation becomes more uniform when you look at that and you don't see that, that wide variability. So the, you know, we, we see wide variability when we see uh, you know, very large structural changes. Um, when you have a, uh, an instrument that's really close, let's say to a cliff or something, you can get a very different reading from that station and one that is five kilometers back away from it. So you have to be careful about where the recording is made, but I think it's possible to, um, to give a good estimate of 
you know, what, how much variability you would expect, because most of it, your number one would be to consider how much variability am I going to get in the side effect? You cannot control what the isochrones on the fault are going to do, but you can control basically how much variability are you going to get due to path effects and local site conditions. Okay. How the path of good is answer. This is clearly. Where is the path of good? Yeah, clear, clear, clear. Sir. Okay. And uh, uh, this question from Pa Andri Stalkyov. Uh, I'm having a hard time determine, determining kappa in an area. Is there a future or trial and error? This is a question from Pak Andri in the chat box. Yeah, I'm looking, um, which one was it? Trial and error? Uh, oh, okay. Oh, uh, having a hard time determining kappa in an area. Okay, the kappa... Um, the um, it if if you're determining kappa naught, um, there there are two different kappas. Well, there's really one in, in Anderson and Huff. There's there's kappa, which is basically the attenuation. Okay, uh, you know how it's attenuating. You know what that number is. Okay, and then there's kappa naught, which is the side effect. Okay, the side effect is the one that is a lot of people just lump into because a lot of studies now showing that the crustal rocks, at least in California, where it's pretty beat up anyway, and it's not unlike Indonesia in that sense uh, along the coast and that, what they find is that when you get to seven or eight kilometers depth, the Q for S waves in that is on the order of 600 or more, which means that there's, you know, it's like, it, that's just crystal. And that's, what, that's like glass. I mean, it's just propagating like crazy. But, but when you come through the local near surface material, you can really attenuate. And so you can look at, as Anderson and Huff did, you can look at the ground motion at that site and say, well, I should be seeing, if I were seeing a true, you know, Brune type spectrum, okay, and I should be seeing, um, a, I should be able to correct to an omega to the minus two. But the best way that they show that because the attenuation, the way it, it, it's, it's parameterized is e to the minus pi f kappa, okay? The best way to do that is to plot log amplitude versus linear because log amplitude versus linear should produce an exponential if it's a straight line. So you can get, the, you can get that, but there's no, uh, you have to be careful about not going too high in the frequency and not the low you don't have to worry about, but. You want to keep it in a range, let's say anywhere between, um, if it's a small earthquake, you want to be beyond the corner. So you want to be, let's say four Hertz and above, you know, four Hertz to 20 Hertz, take a look because that will be the important way to get a Kappa. But you can, you can, but you can, you can make those measurements, get multiple earthquakes and you should come up with pretty much a reasonable value of what Kappa is. You could still get a lot of scatter, but you'll you'll get a number. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, how to Mr. Andri? This clearly. Okay. Any question? All participant. Uh, okay. Maybe I have a question, Professor Rob. Yes. Uh, I look like this the presentation. Uh, is there a relationship between strong ground motion and stress drop? <laughs> yes. The answer is yes, for yeah. sure. No, there <laughs> is. There's, I mean, the stress drop is, and, and this really becomes the question. Um, it's a very good question because you have to be careful about determining whether or not you're looking at what, what seismologists call static stress drop or whether or not you're looking at basically the heterogeneous stress drop, you know, the, the asperities. And this really shows up a lot. I mean, in the Irakura recipe uh, by Kojiro Irakura and Iroi Miyaki, uh, it shows up in, we, we see a lot of it in, in our simulations and, the, and, it, and it probably best uh, described by uh, Gail Atkinson, in fact, and what it really becomes is a stress parameter. What is controlling the high frequencies? Yeah. In other words, 
so the frequency is basically above the corner frequency. The corner frequency is related basically the Brune type corner and that is related to the duration of the rupture. Okay, but what we're interested in when we're interested in ground motion and if you're in close is what is the heterogeneous stress drops. And, yeah. and that becomes the stress parameter. And that number surprisingly is, um, it, it can be regionally dependent. In California, that number works out to be very close to five to seven megapascals. It's about twice what you would get for the average stress drop, you know, static stress drop. So it's, uh, Irakura's method would put it four times higher than the average stress drop, the background stress, but, the, but it's on that order. So, it, and it really determines, the, it, those heterogeneities are what are giving those pulses that give rise to the peak velocities and, and, the, um, and the peak accelerations. But exactly right, the stress drop, but be careful which one you're talking about because what you're really talking about is the stress parameter. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll press one. Uh, any question? Maybe, I think this is enough, Mr. Yeah. Uh, Professor Rapp. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, and before uh, Dr. Walter, I'm so sorry. I will start it without the permission with you. <laughs> oh, no problem. No, everything is wonderful. Everything okay. is perfect. <laughs> okay. Maybe well the uh, second session with the continue second speaker from Dr. Chris Parker. Hello, Dr. Chris Parker. Hi, can you hear Hi. me? Yes, yes, yes. Good morning. Okay. Good morning. <laughs> nice to meet you. Okay, Dr. Chris Parker is a QP6 researcher of the USGS, Menlo Park, California. She is also the lead author of recent Comprehensive study of earthquake prone motion at subduction zone. Okay, uh, Dr. Chris, we have a uh, 40 minutes to deliver presentation and then we'll to continue to discussion for the presentation for about 15 minutes. Okay, time is yours. <laughs> okay, can you see my slides? Yes, good. Okay. Um, so today I'm going to kind of give the second half of the talk I gave yesterday, um, where I introduced um, some basic ground motion modeling concepts and the NGA subduction project. Um, and so today I'll focus on um, just a couple slides on the various uh, ground motion models that came out of the NGA subduction project. And then I'll spend most of my time talking about how I, um, along with my colleagues, developed one of those models. Um, right, so given all of these kind of processes that many of the um, speakers in this course have talked about, how do we build those into um, a model and fit those um, to empirical data? And then I just have a few slides at the very end talking about um, applications of subduction ground motion models to earthquake early warning systems, because that's part of what I work on uh, here at the USGS. Um, so the first part is just a very short introduction to the different ground motion models that were developed um, from the NGA subduction database. And there are four that are published. Um, one by Norm Abramson and um, I'm just trying to pull up my laser pointer, uh, Zeynep Glerchi, AG20. Um, and there's, you know, for all of the four models, there are separate models for the interface earthquakes and the slab earthquakes. Um, and these give the various ranges of uh, applicability, so the distance range, the BS30 range, depth, et cetera. So you have the, the AG20. You have a model by um, the second one here, Nico Kuhn. 
uh, Yusuf Bazormia, Ken Campbell, and Nick Greger, KBCG. Um, and then the model that I developed uh, along with John Stewart, Dave Borg, Gail Atkinson, and Bazad Asani. And these first three models looked at the global NGA subduction um, database to develop their models. And so they have a global version of the model as well as regional versions of their models for specific areas. And then the last model is by uh, professors C. Midorikawa and Kishida. Um, and they only looked at data from Japan. So their model is um, a Japan specific model. Okay, and then this um, table shows the various predictive parameters used by the different modeling groups. And um, as you might expect, all of them use moment magnitude and rupture distance, the closest distance to the fault plane um, in their models to predict ground motions. Two of them use um, depth to the top of the rupture, Z tor. Um, to capture source depth effects. And then uh, to use the hypocentral depth for that, um, as well as the MOHO depth here for the SMK model. All of them uh, parameterize their site response terms using VS30, the time average shear wave velocity in the upper 30 meters. All four of them consider uh, basin depth terms um, for Cascadia, so the Pacific Northwest of the US, as well as Japan. And then uh, Nico Kuhn's et al.'s model also looks at basin effects in Taiwan and New Zealand. And like I mentioned, all four of them um, separate the data and the models based on the subduction zone event type interface or slab earthquakes. Um, and all four of these models um, are described in peer reports, publications online, if you want more details. And um, I think some of them also have earthquake spectra papers that are now available online. Uh, I know that the paper describing the model I worked on um, is available online. So now I'm just going to get into kind of the details of how um, my modeling team approached uh, model development. And this is the subset of the NGA subduction um, database that we considered for interface earthquakes on the left and slab earthquakes on the right. And you can see that um, the records from different regions are color coded differently. So of course, um, for interface earthquakes, the largest events are the um, 2011 Tohoku earthquake in Japan, and then the um, magnitude 8.8 .8 Maui earthquake from Chile. Um, and we considered earthquakes down to about magnitude five for interface events, and then down to um, magnitude four and a half for slab events. And um, someone asked about this yesterday, we considered records all the way out to about a thousand kilometers. And I also wanna note here that um, this model that I'm going to talk about and all the models on the previous slides are for um, horizontal ground motions um, for the ROT D50 um, rotated component uh, of horizontal ground motions and also for 5% um, damped pseudospectral acceleration. And um, in our modeling development approach, there's a few things that are different from the past, the previous models that I talked about yesterday. Um, the first, um, as I've already alluded to, we've looked at a much larger data set than um, was used in previous models. And then we also considered regionalization in um, a number of different terms of the ground motion model, including the amplitude, the analastic attenuation, the magnitude scaling breakpoint, uh, the VS30 scaling, and then the sediment depth or the basin terms. And we also treated almost every term differently between the two event types, the slab and the interface. The only thing that those two models share um, is the site response term that's independent of event type. 
And then um, we also looked at the aleatory variability model um, in kind of finer detail. So we, we looked at the um, site to site and the single station variances and developed um, models to, to estimate those components of the variability. And so um, you should recognize this equation from yesterday where you have um, a scalar intensity measure from earthquake I as station J as the sum of um, three generalized model terms, one related to the earthquake, one related to the path, and one related to the site. And um, when approaching ground motion model development, it's sometimes tricky or difficult to separate out these different terms. So what component of the ground motion is controlled by the source? What's controlled by the site, right? There can be lots of trade-offs here and everyone who develops these models has kind of a different approach for doing that. And the way that we approached it was by first looking at the site response. So we wanted to remove any uh, site effects from the ground motions before trying to fit these earthquake and path terms or the source and path terms. And the way we did that was by using an existing um, site response model from NGA West 2, say on Stewart 2014, to correct or to adjust really all of the empirical data to a single reference VS30 of 760 meters per second. We then with that adjusted data, went back and first fit our path scaling term, our distance scaling term, using those three different components I talked about yesterday. So I won't go through them in detail again, but we looked at near source saturation, the geometrical spreading, and the analastic attenuation. Um, and then we moved to the source term. And how we did that was by using a two-step approach, like I discussed yesterday, where in the regression of the path term, each event is allowed a unique constant. And then we look at those constants to fit this magnitude scaling. Um, and then at the very end, once we're happy with our magnitude scaling, our source step scaling, our, our distance scaling, we go back and look at um, subduction specific VS30 scaling. So we revisit this term. And that's how we try to kind of avoid trade-offs between these three components. And I also um, should mention here, we did this process um, separately for the two event types. So um, we fit the data from the interface earthquakes and the slab earthquakes uh, separately or independently. And so I'll just go through each of these terms, um, what they look like, um, compared to the data and show you um, what the model looks like. So um, the first kind of component we worked on was the near source saturation. And um, the previous models mostly used, mostly constrained this term based on data from shallow crustal regions. So like California um, and similar regions. And um, you can see, this is just an example showing that um, a lot of times for subduction zone earthquakes, there is a, a sparsity of data at the distances where we typically see this saturation. And so this is one data from one earthquake in Japan, and I fit just a simple uh, path model here, and the two different lines have different saturation distances or values of H, um, and they both fit the data equally as well. Right, there's no way we can constrain this term um, empirically. And right, that's for a couple of reasons. Interface earthquakes maybe um, happen offshore. So uh, seismometers on land are kind of far from the rupture. Um, and slab earthquakes um, happen deep in the earth. So the closest distances are um, you know, greater than these sorts of 10 to 30 kilometer saturation distances. And so what we did to address that was look at 
existing results for small magnitudes um, from shallow crustal earthquakes. And then we performed some finite fault simulations using XM, um, kind of modeled after subduction zone interface earthquakes to try to figure out what the large magnitude near source saturation distances were. And that's what this looks like on the top. So you can see um, a model from Yanir and Atkinson 2014 based on active crustal um, earthquakes in these open circles. And then the results from our XM simulations for different periods um, in these colored points. And so what we did was try to match our near source saturation model to um, the Yen and Atkinson results at these lower magnitudes and then fit the kind of upper bound of the XM results at large magnitudes. And so that's what this um, equation shows is this line, this black line here, and it's implemented through the distance term. So um, at very large rupture distances, right, this value is negligible. Um, but as, as our rup gets smaller and smaller, this um, H value can dominate, causing that bending over of the uh, path scaling. And so um, these were modeled for interface earthquakes. And we noticed that for slab earthquakes, um, we were seeing some trends in our residuals indicating that these saturation distances um, were not large enough in the magnitude six to seven range. So what we did was increase our model for slab events um, shown in this red solid line here, but we didn't want um, to let this continue scaling up and up and up at large magnitudes. So we um, capped the value based on some magnitude eight simulations that um, Ralph uh, developed along with uh, his colleague Chen Ji. Um, so we capped the H value based on those simulations for slab earthquakes. And here you can see the R2 models in red compared to existing models in the literature and they both fall pretty well within the range of those models. The next term um, in the path scaling model is the geometrical spreading. Um, and we fit that empirically for response spectra. There's actually, um, right, in 4A amplitude space, it scales um, as one over R mostly. But in response spectra, there's also a magnitude dependence. And we um, adopted that term of our model, our V4 here, from some simulations that um, Bazad Asani and Gail Atkinson had performed, and then we fit um, the C1 coefficient uh, based on our data. And it's hard, right, the geometrical spreading and the inelastic attenuation, the slope and the curvature of this path scaling model can trade off. So to avoid that, we just fit the geometrical spreading coefficient to the data within 100 kilometers of the source. And that's what's shown here for the two different event types. And you can see that there is a difference in the slope. Um, but basically, when you combine C1 with this B4 times magnitude, you get something that's pretty close to 1 over R. It's a little bit um, steeper for smaller magnitude earthquakes, and it's a little bit shallower for um, large magnitude earthquakes. And this is different from previous models where they assumed the geometrical spreading was the same between um, the two subduction zone event types, or they didn't include this uh, magnitude dependence. And then with that geometrical spreading set, we fit our inelastic attenuation, right? Which is how much this line curves in the log-log space. It's just a multiplier on the distance. And that was just um, set empirically. Um, and it's also regionalized, right? This is the per cycle damping of the seismic wave and it's related to um, Q, a crustal property. So we would think it would vary from region to region with different geologic conditions. And we found that it does. So this is that value of analytic attenuation for different regions um, where a more negative value means there's more attenuation. 
So we found that in Japan um, and Taiwan, those regions tend to have more than average or faster than average attenuation. And Alaska in blue, um, South America in light green and uh, Central America and Mexico in orange have kind of slower than average or shallower than average anelastic attenuation. And we think that's related to differences in the geologic um, settings in the different regions. And we also found that um, interface earthquakes tend to have more anelastic attenuation than the slab earthquakes. Okay, and once we were happy with our um, distance scaling model, we looked at those event terms from that two-step process and um, fit our magnitude scaling. So this is what those event terms look like as a function of magnitude. And you can see, as you probably expect, they're increasing. Um, and we fit our magnitude scaling function, which is parabolic, up to a breakpoint and linear beyond that where this breakpoint is set based on a geometrical constraint, um, which was also developed by uh, Chen Ji and Ralph Archuleta for slab earthquakes, right? And this is kind of based on um, the geometry of the subduction zones and an assumed um, aspect ratio, right? So if you, it's just kind of the same concept as that near source saturation, right? Um, eventually when the, earthquake magnitude gets large enough, portions of the fault rupture are far away from you. And so your ground motion is smaller. Um, okay. And then um, we can also look, right, once we have accounted for this magnitude scaling, um, where this is the same plot, we can see if there are any remaining trends with other source parameters, such as um, source depth, right? So we think that our magnitude scaling is representative for some average uh, stress drop condition. But when um, the earthquake stress drop or stress parameter changes, um, we know that the short period ground motion amplitude will change. And some studies have shown that that stress parameter increases with earthquake depth, um, possibly related to an increase in the ambient stress or the strength of the rock with depth. Um, and so we looked for trends in our residuals with hypocentral depth, which we think is more fundamentally related to stress drop. Um, and with less uncertainty in estimations as compared to depth to the top of rupture, which is pretty commonly used, especially for um, shallow crustal earthquakes. But we think for subduction zones, it makes more sense physically to use hypocentral depth here. And we found that for interface earthquakes, we didn't see a very strong trend with depth. Of course, um, the data is kind of sparse, it's hard to tell, but we didn't think our data supported any increase in ground motion amplitudes with depth. But for slab earthquakes, we do think that there's a pretty strong trend in these kind of shallow to intermediate depths. And so we just fit a simple piecewise function that um, increases the ground motion amplitude with increasing hypocentral depth up to about 65 uh, kilometers. And this is um, kind of a global average, right? So we're not trying to, we not, are not trying to capture regional variations here, um, but kind of globally, we see this trend. And I also um, will mention that this is just for short periods, right? Where we think the stress drop is affecting or maybe you know the increase in stress drop is affecting the ground motion amplitudes. At long periods, this trend um, goes away, and our model um, does not increase uh, with depth. Oh, and here are just um, mapping the coefficients of this equation to this function. So m is the slope value here, up to this breakpoint dB, beyond which the the model saturates at uh, the value of D.
Okay, and so once we had our um, path term and our source term for that adjusted reference condition of 760 meters per second, we then went back and used um, the non-reference site approach to compute our empirical site amplification relative to that reference. And um, looked to see if there were any trends uh, with VS30. So what sort of site amplification were we getting? And I will also um, say again here, all the rest of the model was developed independently for these two event types. Um, but our assumption was that site response was independent of event type and we combined our uh, slab and interface data here. Um, and in the end, we went back and tested that by looking at the residuals of the interface and intraslab data and neither of them show uh, any trends with site condition parameters. So we think that for our data set, this is a valid assumption. And so we, this is what our VS30 scaling model looks like, the equation. And this is what it looks like um, as compared to the data. So we do see um, pretty, which is pretty typical, an increase in um, ground motion amplitude um, as the site condition or the VS30 decreases. So for softer sites show larger ground motions. And so this slope, I think we call it um, S1. And that's what the slope looks like as a function of um, response spectral period. And you can see the strongest um, VS30 scaling, the steepest slopes are around one second. Um, and also there are some regional variations here. So the global model, the global average is shown in black but certain regions um, show deviations from that. So in particular, Alaska shows a pretty strong deviation. There's stronger um, VS30 scaling or VS30 has um, more predictive power over site response here than in other regions. And we think that's related to how VS30, oops, sorry. VS30 is correlated with the deeper crustal structure that's controlling the site response. Um, and so, you know, the more correlated it is, the stronger predictive power VS30 will have on the resulting site response. Um, and that varies from region to region, right? So in Taiwan, um, we see the softest sites don't show um, as strong of an amplification as in some other regions. You can see these black triangles here. And then you can also compare, right? All of these are from subduction ground motions, but you can compare this slope, this VS30 scaling between um, shallow crustal earthquakes, earthquakes in stable continental regions, such as Central and Eastern North America, SENA, and subduction. So that's what this plot shows, where the crosses are um, from the NGA West 2 model. So shallow crustal earthquakes, this, these black points are the global value I just showed from the previous slide. And then the open diamonds are from Central and Eastern North America. And the subduction zone, um, the S30 scaling seems to fall kind of in between um, these two other regions. And so right in Central and Eastern North America, I think studies have shown that VS30 is not very correlated with the deeper crustal structure. It does not have very strong predictive power, um, right? And that's real related to um, the kind of strong impedance contrasts in the shear wave velocities profiles there, right? Compared to California, of course, this model is global, but a lot of the data was from California. And there in California have a pretty, um, gradient style profile. So the shear wave velocity kind of increases linearly with depth. And so the average in the uppermost part can be very correlated with the deeper structure. And it seems like, you know, the global average of these subduction zone regions is somewhere in between these two end members. Uh, Dr. Chris, we have a uh, five minute again. Okay. Um, I'm trying to decide if 
going through the rest of these um, model terms is more interesting or the early warning example is more interesting. Um, and I think the example is probably more interesting. So um, I'll just mention that our model has, you know, a basin sediment depth term for Japan and Cascadia. It also has a nonlinear site response function. So it um, models the damping of the ground motions for soft sites and short periods as the shaking intensity increases, right? And this is kind of what that looks like where for very weak motions, you have linear amplification. And as the ground motions increase, you get this damping. Um, it has regionalization in these components, which we've already talked about. And um, we also have um, an epistemic uncertainty model. Um, in the global, in the constant, which is large for the global model, right? So um, there's more uncertainty when you don't know what sort of regional effects are occurring in your ground motions. It's also large for Cascadia because we don't have much data there. We don't really know exactly what the ground motions are going to be like. And then it's lower for these kind of other regions where we have more ground motions. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, we still have until uh, 10 o'clock. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay, you can continue. That's, okay, that's fine. No problem. Um, so just some conclusions about the model. Our, the model is semi-empirical, where we have multiple elements constrained by um, the data, but also by simulations and subduction zone geometry. Multiple components of the model are regionalized. So the model amplitude, the analytic attenuation, the magnitude scaling breakpoint, right? Which is dependent on the, the subduction zone geometry. And then the VS30 scaling and the sediment depth terms are also regional. Um, in Cascadia, we don't have any data from interface earthquakes. So we recommend um, a model amplitude based on the global data. And for slab events, we also recommend that, but we have some data to constrain the path and side effects. So we recommend using the regional terms for those in Cascadia. And for use in regions that aren't considered in model development, we recommend using a range of epistemic uncertainty on the coefficients that captures at least the regional variations observed in the, the regions that we did consider. And we have a model that does that for the, the amplitude. Okay, and then I think I have time to talk about this example, um, which is about subduction zone ground motion models in earthquake early warning systems. So the USGS um, in collaboration with state and university partners operates um, the shake alert earthquake early warning system. And the basic premise of that is that once an earthquake occurs, stations near the fault detect um, the early ground motions, the P waves, relay that information to the system, um, which then estimates a source solution. So where the earthquake is happening and what the magnitude is. Um, and we use that information to forecast um, the shaking region that's going to experience shaking above some threshold and try to send a message to people in that region before the S wave um, reaches them. And there are two algorithms that are operational in ShakeAlert to determine that source information. One is called EPIC for short, and it's a point source algorithm. So it estimates um, a location using travel time calculations and a fixed source depth of eight kilometers. So it estimates um, a hypocentral location basically with always the same depth of eight kilometers. And it estimates a magnitude using an empirical relation um, 
between magnitude and the peak displacement of the P wave from the vertical channel. And that's what's shown here, the log of PD against the, the magnitude. And so the outputs of this algorithm are that magnitude and the epicenter location along with that eight kilometers depth. And the second algorithm is called Finder for short, and it is a line source algorithm. So it uses template matching to find the best fitting line source on the surface um, to recorded PGA values, which is taken as the maximum over all components as the, the waveform evolves. And it uses that line source to estimate a magnitude using the Wells and Coppersmith 1994 rupture scaling relation. So the outputs of this um, algorithm are a line source with a centroid length and strike and a magnitude. And I will also mention that those um, template matching templates are, are populated using the Kua and Heaton ground motion model, which is independent of source depth. And so these two algorithms, um, they work pretty well in California where um, the earthquakes are, you know, relatively shallow compared to subduction tones. Um, and source depth has some effect on the ground motions, um, but not a huge effect. Um, so these, these, this source information is then put into ground motion models um, to estimate these shaking, these alert areas. And there's two products, a contour product. So just um, a concentric ring, right? Everyone within this ring is gonna experience shaking above a threshold. And then also um, a map or a grid product where shaking estimates are developed um, for 0.2 degree grid cells. And so the ground motion model just uses a magnitude and a hypocentral distance if the source estimate is from EPIC or a joiner bore distance if the source solution is from Finder. Um, and then we also convert those, we use the ground motion model to estimate PGA and PGV and convert those into MMI, modified Mercalli intensity um, for the alerting, because we think that the public will understand um, the, the MMI scale from one to 10, um, you know, a little more, it's more digestible than um, peak acceleration or peak velocity values. Um, and so, like I mentioned, this works pretty well in California, but what about um, subduction zones? Right, um, we know that unlike shallow crustal earthquakes, um, slab earthquakes in particular in subduction zones can have a pretty strong um, depth dependence. Right, the ground motion um, can increase pretty dramatically between source depths of around 20 or 30 to source depth of around 60 or 70. Um, and so shake alert, the system, the earthquake early warning system is live in, in Washington, Oregon, where we do have subduction zone earthquakes. Um, how is it going to perform there with these assumed shallow depths and using ground motion models for shallow crustal earthquakes, um, right? ShakeAlert could use subduction zone ground motion models that have um, different scaling with magnitude distance and VS30 than the NGA West models um, and also incorporate dependencies on slab earthquake depth. But we wanna understand how much of a difference this would make on the alerting regions. Um, before we, you know, recommend that ShakeAlert adopt different ground motion models. And to do that, I've computed um, sensitivity surfaces that show the ShakeAlert contour product, so that um, kind of concentric polygon um, that show the, the radius of those as a function of earthquake magnitude and hypocentral depth. So I've tried to kind of distill this information into a two-dimensional surface and an example is shown here. Um, 
And to do that, we use um, a subduction zone ground motion model. So I've used um, the model I developed, Parker et al. 2020, and the um, BC Hydro, the Abrahamson et al. model. Oh, sorry. And converted those um, peak ground motions into MMI using a ground motion to intensity conversion equation. So this follows basically the same procedure that's used in ShakeAlert. And then we can plot the epicentral alert distance to a given MMI threshold. And I had to make some geometrical assumptions basically in this. Um, using um, magnitude rupture scaling relations, as well as um, assuming a dip of, of the subduction zone earthquake, which I took as the average of the Cascadia earthquakes in the NGA sub database, as well as um, the position of the hypocenter on the fault plane, which I've used um, a 0.35 of the down dip width. And that's also based on some work in NGA sub. Um, but once you make those assumptions, you can start to look at surfaces like this, um, where you have depth on one axis, magnitude on one the other axis, and then the color represents the radius, the alert radius, so the distance to a certain shaking threshold, in this case to MMI5. And what we find is that the increase in ground motion with source depth, so along this vertical axis, is greater than the increased attenuation with the added path distance. And that's the case for both of these ground motion models. So it's not just you know, an artifact of our model choice. And we find, for, for example, for a magnitude seven and a half earthquake, this alert radius can vary from um, 210 kilometers about the epicenter for a 70 kilometer deep earthquake to 100 kilometers about the epicenter for a 10 to 20 kilometer uh, hypocentral depth. So that's, you know, a 100 kilometer difference in radius that you can get for the same magnitude earthquake, the same location, just changing the depth. So we think it can have a pretty big impact um, on, on the shake alert performance. Um, and the same thing is true, right? You can have a seven and a half magnitude earthquake and an eight and a half magnitude earthquake that result in the same alerting region, um, depending on their depths. And we find the same thing. These are the same types of plots using just a different shaking threshold, but we find the same results kind of no matter what shaking threshold we choose. And you know, through that sensitivity testing, we determined that if you're using a subduction zone ground motion model for slab earthquakes, the alert radii are highly sensitive to that input hypocentral depth. But that was just looking at the ground motion model predictions. What we really care about are the performance of those alerts as compared to you know, the ground truth shaking, what actually happens. And so to evaluate this, we compared the alerting radii computed using the NGA West 2 model. So what's kind of currently used in ShakeAlert as we compared those to um, the subduction zone ground motion model predictions. And that's what this shows here for uh, the Nisqually earthquake at the 2001 magnitude 6.8 Nisqually earthquake. So we have the um, alert radius for the NGA West 2 models. We have the alert radius using a subduction zone model, but assuming the same hypocentral depth that EPIC assumes, eight kilometers. And then we have a prediction using the true hypocentral depth. And then this um, aqua line is the MMI5 uh, shake map contour. So this is based on recorded data and did you feel it reports? So reports of, of people's felt shaking. And you can see that using the true hypocentral depth really improves our predictions, right? This, this uh, red line, this red circle is, you know, pretty much matching the radius of this 
shape map contour. Of course, we're not capturing the kind of elliptical shape of the contour, right? That's probably related to um, finite fault effects, which this, you know, these contour products don't consider or site response, oops, sorry, or something like that, but kind of the average radius um, looks pretty good and is much larger than the black line, which is kind of the operational uh, system or my estimates of the operational system. And we find really the same thing if we look at another earthquake, the Anchorage, Alaska earthquake from 2018, um, where using the subduction zone ground motion model for the true source depth uh, matches much better with the, the observed shaking. Um, and you see the same thing right there. There's this kind of elliptical shape to the, the contour that we can't capture, but that's, um, related to, you know, our point source assumption, not to the ground motion model. Okay. And um, in conclusion, the NGA sub project resulted in three global ground motion models with regionalized terms and one ground motion model for New Pan. Um, the global Parker et al., the model that I worked on, um, can be applied to regions not considered in model development if you increase the epistemic uncertainty. Um, and you can also apply regional models that consider variations in these different um, model terms. And then lastly, um, the example that I showed, using a regionally calibrated subduction zone ground motion model with source depth information could potentially improve the accuracy of earthquake early warning uh, alerting regions in Alaska and uh, the Pacific Northwest in Cascadia. Um, and I think I'm just about at time now. So um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Chris, for giving us such interesting presentation. Okay. Okay, all participants, now come to discussion session. We have 15 minutes for this discussion. You can raise your hand to ask question directly to Dr. Chris, or you can write question on the chat column. Please, uh, all present, you can make a, your question. Hello. <laughs> Okay. Well, I have a quick question. How many years would it take to make a GMM for Indonesia, do you think? Would it, could it be done in two years or would it take four years or more? Well, I think, uh, right, it depends. That's my favorite answer to give to any question. Um, right, if, it depends on if you're starting from database development, which um, like I, talked about yesterday can be a huge effort. Um, and then it also depends on your starting point for model development. So I think probably in two years, you could take an existing model, right? Whether it's one of the NGA sub models, whether it's BC Hydro, you know, it doesn't matter too much and compare it to your regional data and kind of modify it um, or parts of it to fit, right? That process, um, probably is more efficient than starting from scratch if you're looking to produce something in a shorter time frame. Probably two years if you had a focused effort, mm -hmm. you could build something from scratch if you had a database and you started. But uh, uh, maybe maybe someone can tell us if the database, the database of strong motion records it already exists in Indonesia. Does anyone know? It, it has their has a database been established? Mm. Strong motion, other money. That piece of strong motion. Uh, strong motion, strong motion database. Yeah. Maybe, but Orisa, you know the database uh, strong motion. Maybe establish from. Ah, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, mungkin 2015 eh 
Uh, sorry, I, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe since 2015. But anyway, yeah. it should be started uh, soon because uh, you have a lot of earthquakes and you have now you have a lot of instruments. So it's yeah, an yeah. ideal time to create this database. Okay. And my my perspective would be that it's if you set up a, a procedure for how you want to populate your database, it's much easier to do it right as earthquakes happen. When an earthquake happens, right, you kind of run your procedure, add that data to the database as you go, right, instead of starting from, you know, two years, five years down the line, looking back at a lot, a lot of data, right, and trying to do it all at once. Um, if I were, you know, thinking about how, how to most efficiently collect information. So what would you put in the database? The database would have latitude, longitude, elevation of the sensor, and then the waveform, what, what would be in the database? Right, the, um, the waveform, the intensity measures that you're interested in, right? So peak ground acceleration, peak ground velocity, response spectra if you're interested in that, um, metadata about the earthquake, right? The magnitude, location, depth of the earthquake, um, finite fault information if you have it. Just you could calculate the distances between the, the source and the station. Um, the site condition information if you have it. So is it a soil site or a rock site? Do you have the VS30? Things like that. Yeah, all the factors that uh, the you and the previous speakers have mentioned. That's that's very helpful. Yeah. And the USGS has um, an open source software package on its GitHub that you know can take input waveforms, do some filtering, and do the calculations of the intensity measures like PGA, response spectra, duration in a way that's automated if you're interested in something like that. It's called GM process and it's something that I work with um, pretty regularly and it makes it makes the the process um, much easier because it's all packaged into one automated workflow, right? You don't have to uh, sit there and look at each waveform yourself and pick the corner frequencies uh, and things like that. So that's also something I would recommend if you're interested in building a, a database for strong ground motions. Maybe you could take you know, a break. Or something from, similar. So Grace, maybe you can take a break from your USGS job and uh, work for BMKG for a couple of years to get this done. That would, that would be very efficient. <laughs> that's a joke. That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I have a Grace. Uh, this is Ralph Archuleta. I'm I'm curious whether or not in Indonesia, if you would, you know, given what you just said, uh, you know, they could take some of their earthquakes and just see, you know, where their data would plot on the existing these ground motion models that have been developed for the subduction zones. It would give at least an idea of whether or not they are that different uh, from what's already there, because rather than trying to develop one that is completely new for Indonesia, one might look to see, well, why would I develop something new if the, all the data happened to fit in, in one of those three global um, ground motion models? So, yep. you know, but the I, idea I, is just as you said, they have to get the data, you know, processed in a way that can be compared directly with those models. But, uh, but I think it's, that, that seems like something that, you know, would be done in parallel with whoever developed a database would be to say, well, I'm not going to develop a new ground motion model per necessarily. I'm going to see whether or not we are that much different from what already exists. Absolutely. I think no matter what you do, that would be your first step, right? That's, you know, just get an understanding of, of what your, your data looks like 
Is it similar to the models? Is it different? Is it similar to a certain region, right? Maybe mostly yes. And that would be, that would be great probably, you know, maybe you see some minor variations in one or two terms, right? Maybe the inelastic attenuation is a little different and you could just modify that component, but starting from a reference, right, is much easier and much more efficient than starting from scratch. So I um, absolutely agree. Okay. Maybe, uh, participant, you, any question? Hello, Mbak Donna. Mbak Donna. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How this is a uh, continue to third session, or we will with participant. So there's uh, any question from participant? If you have maybe, do you do you do you have a problem about that one? So please uh, go ahead and be hesitant to deliver. So I think I will, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Walter. Maybe your question, maybe uh uh will answer by uh, our expert from BMKG. Maybe uh, your schedule after this one, maybe uh, you, you you want to be, you, you will uh, present about your material. So maybe if if you want to answer your, if you want to get uh, answering from uh, of your question, so maybe we, we can uh, switch switch on. So after this one, maybe uh, I, uh, as a pleasure, I invite, Expert from BMKG because uh, but, but Oriza is uh, already joining in this uh, meeting. So uh, it is a possible. Yes. Maybe you, you, you talk about the grammar okay. emotion database. It's, it's, maybe. Okay, uh, well, let's do it. Let's do it that way. Good suggestion. So we can switch the presentation. Please, please invite uh, your colleague. Yeah, I agree. Okay, okay. May, uh, so, <laughs> any question from <laughs> any, uh, anyone? Uh, uh, yeah, oh, sorry, uh, Miss Grace, I think I have the one question for you. Uh, how about the large area of the rupture? And does this influence the the, your model, of course. Yeah, so one of the ways we consider that is through our choice of uh, source to site distance metric, right? So we used the rupture distance, the closest distance to the, the finite fault. So in that way, um, right, <laughs> sites that are close to any portion of the finite fault um, or, you know, the closest portion of the fault to the site is what's uh, controlling the ground motion. Um, right, and you can see that in the, uh, the near source saturation, but also it's the same distance metric that's controlling the geometrical spreading and the analastic attenuation. So instead of using a point source distance, we use a finite fault distance. Okay. Yeah, please, Mr. <laughs> Anyone to us? <laughs> Yeah, maybe. Uh, I think maybe. Uh, I want to the representative of the employee from the regional regional BMKG. Of course, maybe, maybe, maybe. Can you uh, could you uh, share about uh, there's a ground motion uh, mod a ground motion in that habits in your workplace? So maybe uh, I want to a representative of the regional uh, BMKG maybe. If you have, if you have uh, something like that. 
Mbak Dona, I'm sorry. This session uh, will be with Mbak Dona. Eh? <laughs> so, no. Uh, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry, okay. Mbak Dona. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Dr. Chris. Thank you, Dr. Walt. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Mbak thank you, ya, Mbak. Yeah. Thank you, um, uh, Pak Hakim Aris Rahmat. Yeah, I take over this session. Maybe, uh. Yeah, after uh, sorry, a while we wait a question from the participants. So maybe we are going uh, we are going to the next uh, material, I think. Okay. So, okay. Good idea. Yes. <laughs> yes, sorry. Uh, maybe I invite uh Miss um Oriza Sativa and a partner. So maybe you want to talk about sorry, I have it open my schedule. Uh, you want to talk about definition, parameter, and characteristic of, of a ground motion. And maybe I want to read uh, slightly information about her. About um, Oriza Sativa from the, the Center for Technical Seismology, Seismology, uh, Potential Geophysics, and time, uh, time Marker. And then uh, he had a graduated uh, uh, in a geophysics uh, engineering ITB, a bachelor, a bachelor degree, and he continued a master of civil engineering Flinder University of South Australia. So maybe you have a time. Uh, maybe uh, yeah, yeah, uh, forty-five minutes to deliver your material. So. Um, Oriza Sativa, are you ready? Yes. Yeah, floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Badona, for the opportunity. Uh, the Honorable um, uh, Nelly, as the head of the training center of BMKG, uh, the Pasupri, who are the head of the uh, research uh, and development center, and also for the speakers, the Dr. Walter Mundi, nice to meet you. Nice to see you again. Do you remember me? Uh, I, uh, 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 I'm presented. I'm presented about the liquefaction in Yogyakarta uh, yes. uh, around three months or four months ago. Uh, I'm also Dr. Grace Parker from Rock and also Prof. Jimori. Uh, okay, uh, I'm happy to be here. Can share. Sharing and learn together through this training. May I share the presentation? Yes, of course. You can do it. Bye. Is everyone can see my slide, my presentation? Just no. load, <laughs> just loading. Bye. Masih Masih belum terlihat, Mbak. I don't know. Maybe because my video also freeze. Oh. I think it's okay if your camera off. with the zoom can i leave for a moment yes yes that's right <laughs> but all uh could you maybe uh, maybe you 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 you, you can you will uh, share your ppt and uh like we don't share screen either. Yeah. 
Yeah, sorry, uh, well, maybe there is uh, something uh, technical difficulties from the by Oriza. Yeah, please, uh, Mas Imran uh, from Islamet Kalima uh, Marau, yeah, Kalimarau, please. Yeah, yeah. I think Orisa okay. can email you her lecture and you can for, show the for doc, Dr. Gret. Oh. Uh, what okay. is your uh, what is your opinion about the that the determination of of the grand mission method on the the uh, Borneo Island uh, as the na national capital candidate. Thank you. Maybe maybe someone can repeat the question uh, one more time. Uh, Madonna, did you get the question? Well, I think when he said I Iceland, he means island, island. I, uh, island, like. Maybe uh, the question in the chat, uh, Tajun. Oh, okay. Yeah, from Imran, uh, from Stamet Kalimarau. What is your opinion about the determination of the ground motion modeling on the island of Borneo as the nation capital candidate? Well, there are no earthquakes there. It's very quiet. There, there is no seismicity, no earthquakes. So it's very stable, I think. Of course, uh, there can be some regional earthquakes, but um, the island of uh, Borneo has very few, very few uh, earthquakes. So it's quite safe. I'll show, a, I will show a seismicity map in my lecture, or I can show you now if you want to see. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, my computer suddenly freeze. Okay, now it's free. Now it's okay? Okay. Please, please continue. Thank you, Prof. Ah, we see your, we can see your, uh, your presentation now. Now you go full screen. Wait. Uh, uh, jadi yang saya screen ya. Ya, nggak apa ya. Nanti takut nanti ada ini lagi. Okay. Thank you, Madonna. Okay. Um, thank you. And this uh, 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 training through the training, I want to sharing um, about the strong motion of the strong motion monitoring under the engineering small gate division in BMKG. Actually, uh, in this presentation, I would like to more share about what currently uh, BMKG uh, doing with um, our strong motion da data. Next. Okay, my presentation will be will be um, divided to two four part. Uh, first, uh, the definition about the the ground motion and the parameter, of course. Uh, but might be uh, this is uh, already explained uh, by the previous speakers. Uh, the second part, uh, the BMKG strong motion processing system. Uh, the third part, the PMKG strong motion record uh, analysis, and the last part is the future plan uh, of our strong motion uh, data. We want to develop the strong motion database actually. Um, so um, hopefully, in the future, we can uh, make or regenerate the existing GMPA. Next. Um, 
Okay, this is the basic, the basic definition of uh, the promotion parameters uh, that very essential for describing the important strong motion uh, income type. Uh, many parameters has been proposed uh, to, char to characterize the amplitude, frequency, content, and also duration. Uh, next. Okay, uh, I tried to make uh, the detail of the parameters. Even this is not all the ground motion parameters because there are so many uh, ground parameters that had to be lit. Uh, but this is the common uh, parameters for, for ground motion. As we uh, now for the amplitude parameters, we have the GPA, uh, uh, PGA, the ground motion acceleration, the ground, the peak ground velocity, and also the peak ground dispersion. For the frequency parameters, we have the ground motion spectra, spectral parameter, and also the ratio between the velocity and the acceleration. For the amplitude uh, parameter, usually uh, the damage uh, very closely related to the peak amplitude, uh, but in orders made not for all earthquakes. Uh, this is uh, uh, depend on the site uh, of the station. For the frequency, the, the, the dynamic uh, response building, like a bridge, uh, slopes, uh, and also cell, soil deposit, is very sensitive to the frequency in which uh, they do it. The frequency content describes how the amplitude of ground motion is distributed among different frequencies. Okay, for the power spec, uh, for the Fourier, Fourier it is like a uh, the direct comfort from the time series to the frequency series. Um, while the power spectra, uh, it is like a, the frequency that has um, the harmonic uh, specific uh, frequency. So in that spectra, we can uh, show the power of a frequency that can uh, describe in the signal in the in the uh, earthquake. I mean, the third uh, spectra is response spectra. As we know, the response spectrum is described uh, the maximum response of the single degree of freedom system to a particular input motion as a function of natural frequency or natural period and damping ratio of the single degree of freedom. Next. Okay. Uh, let's continue to the second part. This is the, the strong motion uh, monitoring system in BMKG. We have uh, around 669 accelerograph that located around Indonesian area uh, until 2022 in February. Next. Next. Uh, but um, mostly the location of the sensor of the station uh, are located in the medium soil. Uh, there's only three or four, if I'm not mistaken, that installed in a backdrop um, location. Next. Okay. Um, this is the processing system uh, for the strong motion. Uh, so when the earthquake occurs, the I mean the earthquake parameter comes to our system, the system will be record the strong motion data from each station and uh, generate uh, the I mean uh, generate the shake map 
in the SIGMA system, we also uh, put the VS30 observation uh, and the GMPA, part the GMPA using the existing GMPA. Next. This is the list of GMPE that used in ShakeMap, that, uh, I mean, the BMKG ShakeMap for, for time. Next. Next. In the ShakeMap directory, we produ uh, produce the earthquake uh, ground, ground earthquake parameters, such as PGA, PGV, and MMI. Uh, MMI. Also, there are also uh, calculation of grids of VS30, then conversion from the PGA to the intensity. Next. Okay, this is the current result analysis for our strong motion processing. Um, for each earthquake, that will be uh, produced a signal, the strong motion record, the spectral acceleration, also the shape map. Uh, Besides the strong motion, uh, I mean the accelerogram, the, the single accelerogram, we also have this uh, separate health monitoring instrument that installed in two locations in uh, Jakarta and Bali. Uh, this instrument also produces the PA, PSA, uh, and also the continuous natural pre pre predominant period. But um, uh, unfortunately, this instrument um, cannot uh, show the quality of the building. This on um, because usually the structure half monitoring analysis uh, result will uh, produce uh, something like gra graphs that can show the 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 quality of the of of how the building. Okay, this is the. The 12 sensor that installed in main building Jakarta, and the other side G sensor in Bali. This is the example of uh, SHM monitoring for the earthquake in Banten. We can see the Attenuation, I mean, uh, the, the amplification uh, between the ground floor and also the 12th floor. There is also a spectral acceleration for each record. We have uh, also seismic hole been so in four location but uh, there are uh, obstacles uh, for this uh, equipment because uh, it is difficult to do the maintenance so the result um, so many earthquake cannot record properly uh, but next we have one good example for the borehole seismic data result in Bali for Jembrana earthquake. The red one is the acceleration in the surface and the blue, the blue color, it is the acceleration in the uh, in the depth. And this is uh, the, the last one, uh, the acceleration in the borehole location. <laughs> and the uh, right, the right uh, acceleration in the surface. We can see the amplification between the bore, uh, bore, bore hole location and the surface location. Next. Uh, this is, uh, there are uh, four. For example, of uh, earthquakes that 
I want to show uh, that occur in this year. First, the Padang the Padeglang earthquake on 14 January 2022. Uh, the mass is 6.6. The location is 152 kilometers southwest of Pandeglang, and it was at 40 kilometers. Nice. This is the earthquake image that it, that documented well, from the uh, surface survey teams. Next. This is the stronger motion uh, that record the data. This is for Jabi station for three components. Um, and this is the PSA, the spectral ration for Jabi. The blue is the for the is component. The red is for the north component, and the green, the light green, is for the practical component. Next, same case for another uh, station for Chengkare. This is the northern part of Jakarta. Next, this is uh, the office of governor. Jakarta in the central Jakarta, we can see the different um, the period, the, the maximum the maximum acceleration that uh, uh, occur in the in the long longer period than the northern part. Next, this is in the South Tangerang. It's a certain part of Jakarta. The frequency is quite uh, a quite big priority of frequency. Next. Uh, this is the last one in Depok, the in University Indonesia. Also, I think uh, quite similar to the Tangerang area. Um, besides uh, the strong motion record, uh, we also, and also spectral acceleration, we also calculate the design equipment force. force. Uh, we want to know uh, is the earthquake, I mean, the spectra is still under the design, uh, I mean, the, the standard design of Indonesia. By using the Indonesian standard national 2019. Uh, so for the Pandegla earthquake, the this the earthquake spectra still under the design. Next. The second earthquake, this is the quite um, significant earthquake on 6.1 that occur on 25 February 2022 uh, in the 17 kilometer northeast of West Pasaman, West Sumatra. Uh, this is the strong motion record and spectral acceleration and also the earthquake uh, design uh, earthquake force. The spectra still under the design, so um, it is a quite unique because in the area or uh, the survey teams of the earthquake found um, many buildings, but not uh, a, a good building like a, <laughs> like a house, just the collapse. So I think it is not because of the earthquake, but uh, it is um, <laughs> it is also depend on the site characterization. Sorry, next. The third earthquake, I mean, no, no. The, the, the last earthquake is the Mamuju earthquake that just uh, recently occurred on June. This is a quite unique earthquake because uh, the earthquake is not quite too big, just 
A, and this uh, the location in the ocean, not in the land. Uh, but uh, also the survey team found um, several damage that caused by the earthquake. Next. Um, and also again, um, from the design of the earthquake force, the spectra acceleration is still under the design of uh, the National Indonesia design. Uh, so I think this is the quality of uh, if there uh, was the building collapse um, when the earthquake occurred, it is because of the quality of the building. Next. Okay. Um, for the third water, maybe might be this is the the I will answer the question in here because uh, unfortunately Indonesia uh, still doesn't have the slow motion database uh, as a formal. That, that's why uh, our division uh, has a big dream on for the future work to develop the strong motion database for Indonesia. So hopefully we can uh, generate the GMPE for Indonesia. So we can, the step is uh, we regression the recorded data, estimating the motion parameters that I explained uh, before. Um, and also uh, consider the earthquake source, like a subduction fault, and also the focal mechanism. Okay, um, the step also establish the database. Select the predictive equation, perform regression analysis, and evaluate uncertainty. So when we have uh, data, good data, we just regression analysis the suffered data. But this is uh, rare, especially in Indonesia. We just start install the strong motion equipment in 2007. And um, the data uh, from the 2007, the data is not, not, not good. I mean, uh, there is, so many lacking of analysis of strong strong motion, uh, but in 2012 we try to um, to do um, to make uh, not a database but try to uh, make a good a directory, good uh, a storage for the uh, strong motion recording. But when the uh, data are lacking, we use we can use the simulating data, the making a motion from the smaller events, and also uh, using the hybrid method. This method are already done actually um, by one of uh, BMPG expert, uh, Ariska when she did his master in Australia, but the, the, I mean, the data just until 2015. Next. Next. Okay, this is the, uh, the upper one, uh, the observed data adequate for regression system except except close to the large earthquake. Uh, but if the observed data are not adequate for regression, we can use the um, simulation data. data. Uh, what to use for the prediction variables? So we need the moment magnitude. We have to calculate distance measure that already explained by Dr. Parker uh, yesterday. Uh, we need the side turns and maybe style of fault. I mean, the, the characteristic of the 
default. Next. Yeah, this is already, uh, I think same, the, the principle is same that already Dr. Parker uh, explained yesterday in the yesterday material. Next. Nice. Why we, like I said before, why we need to develop the slow motion database? We can see in the peer database, uh, Indonesia is uh, hasn't yet contribute to uh, share the slow motion data uh, until now. So uh, we hope we can contribute our strong motion to the international database. So. Uh, hopefully, Dr. Parker can, can help us to develop the ground motion prediction equation that's suitable for Indonesia. Next. Uh, this is the GMB that, uh, that recommended from National Earthquake Studies Center. For the coastal, shallow coastal earthquake, we use the Bohr Atkinson NGA. Campbell Bogorsnia showing you in GA. For the plate boundary earthquake source, we using DC Hydro, uh, Atkinson Bohr, Zou et al. And the last uh, for the Instraslab Instra earthquake source, we using Atkinson Bohr, Young et al. and Atkinson Bohr. You see. Next. Future work. We have to improving staging information and adding recent strong motion records into a database, uh, investigating and comparing the existing GMPAs. Uh, might, might be, uh, we have to study uh, technique how to modify the existing GMPAs or developing the new one for GMP for GMPAs that based on Indonesia data. Yeah, that's uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arita. I think there'll be many questions uh, from, from uh, Dr. Grace Parker, Jim Mori, and uh, Archuleta, if, if Ralph is still here. Uh, maybe, uh, Grace, do you have a question? Sure. Sorry, I had to find my uh, unmute button. Uh, well, first, I just want to say thank you for the really interesting talk. It's really um, neat to see um, all of the data that you presented. And um, I thought it was really clear and well laid out. Um, so thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I guess um, I guess my question is what um, I'd be interested to hear more about um, your kind of your future plans, your your next steps. I I think it seems like you have um, the ground motion waveforms right archived. What do you think your next step will be? Um, towards those lists, that list of uh, future work that you uh, that you listed, and what are the steps that are um, difficult, right? What are the roadblocks that you're encountering? Uh, the problem, the, the big. Uh, firstly, um, we have an obstacle to because mostly of our strong motion. Uh, installed in the like I said in medium soil, so majority of uh, the strong motion record from the, the station that uh, has such uh, classification D or medium soil. Um, the second one, um, we not uh, we don't have. So many enough. I mean, enough data to to make uh, the regression because we already try uh, to comp uh, compile all of the data 
and so you find it uh, i mean follow the step to uh, develop the uh gmbr strong machine database but uh we still like um not sure with the regression dr press uh, because of the lack of the data the the third one is um, um because um we also use we currently use the existing data because um um we just um directly uh compare after we do the regression we did the regression we just directly uh compare with the gmbe that recommended from the uh, expert in indonesia uh, because uh to be honest the bmk never uh, do the uh, to 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 know which gym is that suitable for indonesia except the pariska that uh, pariska already did for his master thesis but um i think it is to be continued i mean i mean it is a uh, best it is a good idea if we continue the 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 work because it's not not um, not yet finished yeah that's the obstacle uh is it a problem i mean is it a big uh problem if the i want to ask to you is it a big problem if the station the strong motion station installed it not in the bedrock location i i personally don't think that that's a problem i think right the important thing is that you know some information about what the soil is where your oh, okay. your station is right so if, if you know that it's um a soft site that's knowing that information is more important than than having a, a bedrock and a station and um most of the work i've done mm -hmm. uses an approach to estimate site <clears throat> response and develop site response models that's called the non-reference site approach uh -huh. and so to to use that approach you don't need a reference site i, I think um one of the speakers yesterday mentioned that i can't remember who it was right like one one way to estimate site response is to take a ratio of two sites one bedrock one soil and you can get a ratio right but you can also instead of using a bedrock site you can use a ground motion model prediction at a reference velocity basically instead of a record on a, on a hard rock site um, right and you can use you know whatever ground motion model you're finding fits the data you have the best it doesn't have to be you know uh, an indonesian developed model you can just use what you have to start with that's my that's my take on the problem maybe other um participants have different ideas or different opinions thank you so uh, i had a question for you miss sativa and that yes. is that um, I expected to see in your presentation, which was you know, comprehensive, but the simplest uh, plot to make is a plot that you've seen from um, you know, Gray showed this yesterday and that um, it's quite simple to make is just magnitude versus distance where they show, you know, for, you know, you have magnitude on the left on your ordinate and distance on the right and then just plot for every earthquake, the magnitude that you assigned and just which stations, you know, what distance range do you have? What magnitudes do you have, you know, recorded, you know, 
in Indonesia, because that's the very first starting place to know, you know, what, what type of data are we going to be looking at, what distance range, and what is the magnitude range. And so, um, what I don't have a feeling for is you know, just how many records do you have for magnitude six and a half? How many ma how many records do you have for magnitude six point seven nine? And over what distance? Because I think that that's important to know what what your what is the basic numbers that you have for your data, and you clearly have that because you have a magnitude, and you know the distance to every station. So it would be helpful for us to give some insight as to what you might do with the data, depending on what records exist. I mean, you could have lots of small records, but we're interested in let's say magnitude five and above right now, and 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 what distance range do you have? I mean. How many magnitude earthquake? How many earthquakes do you have recorded that are magnitude six point five to seven, that are in the distance in and a distance range out to let's say um, one hundred kilometers, and and what's the closest distance that you have? Are they all beyond twenty? Are they all beyond you know? So I think it'd be very important to have that type of data, you know, that you could present to us so that we have some idea of, you know. You know what sort of database are we looking at that we might have provide advice about how to process it? Yeah, thank you. Actually, we already did that, but only uh, uh, from 2012 to 2015. It is like uh, we only have like uh, um, less than 300 earthquakes. That's why uh, we are still need more earthquakes. Maybe I will show you. How, but how many of those earthquakes are, are larger than magnitude five and a half? Uh, we use uh, for, uh, for the, uh, the research that we did in 2015, there is a, uh, Magnitude with oh, about five. All of the for the earthquake magnitude above five. Five magnitude. How many earthquakes have magnitude greater than five? I will show you the table. And the crash tower total is four, yes, less than, less than 300. The, the crash tower is around four, the interface 63, mm -hmm. the intra slab. 161, the unknown type 21. And these are all magnitude greater than 5.5 .5 or yes. greater than 5? Okay. Five. Five. And, and, and what is the distance range that you have for the these interface and intra-slab earthquakes? In other words, is it... Um, what distance range are they from the hypocenter or from the epicenter? This was a long time ago.
Um, we select by the year, by the depth, by the magnitudes, and uh, by the earthquake regime. Just this one, that, just this step that we did. Well, um, I, I can say something that the recording of strong ground motion data with many stations is something relatively new. And we know that there are only 14 magnitude seven earthquakes mm -hmm. per year yeah. worldwide in the entire world, which means that the number of larger events is gonna be quite small as you probably inferred so the plot that you asked for, magnitude versus distance recorded, would be very, uh, very informative, and uh, would not show a lot of large magnitude events captured. Yeah, but certainly, you know, a lot of fairly large number of moderate earthquakes, right? Like 60 slab earthquakes and 100 and something interface earthquakes above magnitude five. Yeah. You know, a, the, couple thou a couple thousand records. Yes. That's, correct. that's you know, compared to other regions like the central and Eastern US, that's a, that's a lot. It, compared to Cascadia, that's huge. Yes. In other words, so- Yes, I like mean, this, this, this is, is impressive to me. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a good data set. Yes. I think you sold yourself a little short. You have you have more data than um, than a number of, of other regions, I would say. And and increasing every week and every month because you saw the number of accelerometers. <laughs> it's a huge spread over a very large area. Okay, so I, think I we should, uh, get a question from Jim Mori. Uh, Jim, you're, you're uh, invited to comment. Okay, he was here, but I think he probably has another meeting because I know that the time in Japan is now 12 o'clock, so he, he's busy. Okay, back to you, uh, Madonna or uh, Oriza. Okay, thank you, Walter. Uh, I think from this presentation, maybe there's a, there's a special requi uh, request from the speaker especially um, uh, Oriza Sativa. So maybe the next, uh, the next, uh, maybe we, we, we can uh, collaboration again uh, to conduct the uh, particular uh, training about how to uh, ground motion, how to arrange or maybe how to build ground motion prediction model at the end, something, something else. So I think because uh, BMKG also, uh, no, BMKG uh, now this condition BMKG is, is uh, still uh, trying to develop and, uh, to developing about this one. So I think it's a very, <laughs> just a lot of suggestion for, uh, for me. <laughs> maybe for, for the next, for the next, maybe for the next uh, training set, maybe we can, uh, yes. Idea. Yeah, and, idea. yeah, and that, and that, uh, and the training, I think especially for, for the employee of MKG, uh, especially from uh, the, uh, in uh, their in a position, I think uh, in the position have uh, have a policy uh, to make to make promotion that the best something like that. So I don't know maybe in this year. Uh, yes, yeah, it's a very good idea. Yeah, I agree. Okay, I invite uh, everyone over here. Uh, maybe do you have a do you have a question uh, for? Um, 
Miss uh, Dr. Grace Parker, or maybe you have, uh, if you have a question for uh, Miss uh, Risa Satifa, please don't be hesitant. So maybe uh, I I hope uh, a participant from the regional BMKG. Maybe do you want? Uh, maybe you can uh, share about uh, anything else uh, related to. Uh, ground motion and anything else. So maybe you have a problem about that. Good yeah, morning. I hope that this training uh, give you uh, give you maybe inspiration or uh, anything uh, to to make the research. Please. <laughs> um, I don't know. Can I say something to Dr. Grace? Okay, please, please, please go ahead. Hi, uh, Dr. Grace, can, may I uh, discuss with you after this training um, about uh, how to do, I, mean, I want to continue uh, our work uh, because uh, it is quite long um, uh, stop from 2015. So I think it is, uh, this, this year is, uh, um, I mean, uh, a good uh, time to start again. Yes, uh, I'm happy to um, talk further, you know, about any, um, any of the work that you're doing um, with you or anyone else who's, who's interested. Um, I'm happy to talk further and I might just put my email address in the chat. Okay. Is that okay? okay so that you can you very much. email me. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so you can you can contact me by email um, after the training if you have more questions or you want to talk about oh, any other thank topics. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm happy to discuss yeah. with you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Grace Parker. So anyone? Anyone? Uh, if you have uh, maybe problem. Yeah, especially in a participant who join in this uh, training. So I think it's not only from, uh, it's not only a staff or maybe observer because a participant who joining in this training, maybe uh, people who have uh, make a decision in the, their workplace, something like as a leader in the, leader in the, in the geophysics station. So maybe I invite a, uh, representative of the maybe uh, uh, people who who have a, a policy and something who have a, a task uh, to make a decision so please yeah, because uh because uh how to something uh ground motion uh, to to arrange uh, arranging a ground motion uh database i think it's as uh, the 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 men uh, the men <laughs> what is, it? is it very is it very busy in your place? <laughs> Sorry, I'm in office. <laughs> never mind. Okay, yeah, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> okay, uh, I invite uh, people who want to maybe. Um, it's another thing. Uh, okay, uh, I think it's, it's done. <laughs> so uh, maybe we are going to the next uh, matter, I think. So, so I invite uh, uh, Dr. Walter Mooney. So you want to talk about... Uh, oh, sorry, I... I I open my schedule. Oh, Sesame City of Indonesia. So. All right, let me, let me find my PowerPoint. Okay, please. Okay. And I believe you, everyone can see my slide. Is that right, Madonna? Yes, yes, it's good. So 
I'll give a short talk on seismicity of Indonesia, but I'll try to highlight some of the topics that we have uh, covered in the last three hours. So uh, Dr. Grace Parker has talked about the development of uh, ground motion models for many regions in the Circum Pacific. And so the next step we need to take is to uh, do the similar kind of work uh, in Indonesia. And you can see this equal amount of earthquakes, no lack of uh, seismicity. I'll show an even better plot soon. And um, the region uh, has many faults so that there is uh, a strong opportunity to get seismic recordings close to the events, large events that were be close to the events. And we'll look at that uh, some more. I'm gonna go to full screen, okay. So-called presentation mode. My computer's thinking, there we are. What about the site effects? This is a uh, geologic map that we recently published uh, for the region. And you can see uh, this is according to the age. So the young sediments and volcanics are in yellow. And um, the hard rock is only in a few sites. Those would, hard rock would be mainly the darker colors like brown, Mesozoic, uh, brown Paleozoic and some of the others. A lot of Indonesia would be on soft soils. So I have a circle now emphasizing that the dominant colors that we see are rather young rocks. It's not like the Eastern United States or it's not like Japan either. Japan has some uh, much older rocks in various places. So a great opportunity to study subduction zone ground motions because the region is co completely covered with uh, active subduction zones. Uh, there are different interpretations of where some of the shorter subduction zones actually exist. So there is some debate and uh, you can see that uh, there are some short segments that are back thrusts uh, in the back arc region. And I'll, I'll mention that uh, shortly. Great opportunity for subduction zone seismicity. It's good to keep in mind that there are two regions of study. One is the continental region, shallow water environment, of Borneo, Thailand, Sumatra, as contrasted to the, the oceanic environment. So I'm not uh, to, the, to the east, in Celebes Sea, Banda Sea, and elsewhere. It may not be that we want to develop a single ground motion model for, in, in, for a country as large as Indonesia and with clear uh, diversity in uh, geologic setting. Uh, some of the slides I'm showing you are from our paper in uh, AGU publication, G cubed, on uh, the seismicity of Indonesia and its tectonic implications. You can get it for free download, but I'll send a copy to uh, Madonna. It's a large file. It's about 26 megabytes, so it's can't send it around by email. Well, here's 20 years of seismicity in the region. And... Uh, this should provide enough events. Um, this doesn't have, uh, the only way you can tell the magnitude is from the, oh, magnitude is not scaled here. Depth is scaled, sorry. So magnitude information is not given, but you can see the abundant seismicity. And as we know by the Gutenberg-Richter relation, that if you have frequent seismicity, you're going to have some large events. The deep events, 
are in red, the uh, shallower events above uh, 100 kilometers or so in, are in blue, and the deep events are not present everywhere. They're more abundant um, locally. Uh, you can see them yourself uh, north of um, Java and in Banda Sea and to the north, south of the Philippines. Very few deep events beneath Sumatra. Borneo uh, is in the center of the map and only a portion of that island has seismicity. Basically, it's um, a stable continental fragment. So here's a plot of the number of earthquakes um, per year as a function of depth. Uh, it's a log scale so that uh, 10 to the 2 is clear there, 100 earthquakes per year. Most of the seismicity occurs in the upper uh, 70 kilometers, and it rapidly decreases until it reaches a depth of about 400 kilometers, where it begins to flatten out and, in, in fact, have some um, increases at the dismantled discontinuities at 410 and, and above 660. Above 660, not at 660. So rapid de decline in seismicity but uh, for Grace, you can see there's lots of earthquakes at all depths. You know, there's going to be events at 100 kilometers, 200, plenty at 300, even, even down to 660. So let's take a look at uh, one particular region uh, south of um, the Philippines and north of Sulawesi, Halmahera. We're going to look at BB prime, that's the southern cross section. So you have a double subduction zone, very interesting. It's, uh, it's a plate that's subducting both to the east and to the west. You can find everything in Indonesia. There is something for everyone. Uh, the seismicity is most abundant down to a depth of about 200 on the San Gehi slab and a little bit deeper on the uh, Hal Mahera slab. Then there are intermediate depth earthquakes um, at between 300 and 600 kilometers depth. So we have a U-shaped Benioff zone, quite an unusual geometry. Why? Why do we have these earthquakes at all these depths and some gaps in the seismicity. So here's a diagram showing the um, a lithosphere being subducted, and I'm going to step through with depth. Shallow seismicity, which we'll call zero to 50 kilometers. Sometimes shallow earthquakes are called zero to 70. It, it's, uh, it's not that important for the present moment are the megathrust boundary earthquakes and the earthquakes on the upper plate. In contrast, intermediate depth earthquakes, 50 to 350, uh, are often fewer in number and cannot be as ascribed to a frictional slip on a megathrust boundary uh, instead, these are often modeled in the laboratory and theoretically as slab embrittlement caused by dehydration. As the slab is being pushed into the mantle, uh, it's going, undergoing higher pressure and temperatures and fluids are driven off, making mineralogical changes in the properties of the rocks and making them more brittle. M brittlement just means to be made more brittle. In contrast, the deep earthquakes are believed to be associated with these phase boundaries, particularly the olivine wasleyite phase boundary. Uh, olivine is a mineral Si2 silica, Mg2O4, it's a silica magnesium oxide, 
and it undergoes a phase transformation uh, under higher pressure. So it's really interesting. We as students thought we understood earthquakes as simple mo motion on a rupturing on a fault, which is certainly the case for shallow crustal earthquakes. But as we go deeper into the earth, uh, the mechanisms change. The magnitudes of some of these earthquakes can be uh, magnitude eight and larger. And the uh, deep focus earthquakes have very few aftershocks. They, they occur once and um, have few aftershocks, not maybe uh, a handful. You remember the focal mechanisms that, as we descri were described by John Abel. We can see here the strike slip thrust and normal faulting. Uh, I think the next slide I might be showing uh, the focal mechanisms for deep earthquakes. You'll see a lot of normal faulting. Keep in mind the uh, white area in the center of the sphere. And here we are, the white area in the center of the sphere. These are deep fo focus earthquakes. These earthquakes are occurring at 600 kilometers depth and they're normal faulting events. Uh, you get a diversity of mechanisms, even uh, also thrust faulting. Um, but uh, the main point is that deeper focus earthquakes are quite abundant in Indonesia, everything be below 50 kilometers to 660. And although normal faulting events are common, uh, you can also get thrust faulting and even strike slip components to them. And they cover much of the country. So these, these deep earthquakes here uh, will have um, normal and thrust faulting components. Now we can look at what this slab looks like. You see some gaps in the seismicity and the question might come, whether the slab is broken, detached, or whether it's continuous. So one way we can answer that is by using seismic tomography together with the uh, earthquake locations. And I'll tell you the answer before we look at the next cross section. The, well, the answer is that the slab seems to be continuous. The blue color is present even where there are no earthquakes. And this is true for all of these cross sections. So the subducting slab unexpectedly has seismicity gaps in, with depth, but the tomography is suggesting that the plate itself in many regions is continuous. So it's really a nice joining of geophysical techniques seismicity together with seismic tomography. Let's look at a cross section here with this double subduction zone in the Molokka Sea. And this is what the plate looks like. Um, a piece of it subducting to the east and the, another piece subducting very, very deeply. So this cartoon is based on the seismicity together with the uh, tomography. The tomography was what tells us that it's uh, continuous and we can anticipate earthquakes pretty much at any depth in that system. Here's that plate in 3D with the rotating cube, the deep, deeply, now you see the shallow and deep, it's coming around again. Now it's kind of reversed. Okay. Uh, so you have a double subduction zone and the tomography shows the slab is continuous even in seismicity gaps. So we can expect to have earthquakes at nearly any depth. And uh, actually this entire Malika Sea will soon disappear without a trace. The slab, the U-shaped slab will be consumed and that'll be it. Sumatra. In Sumatra, we have lots of megathrust earthquakes. I'm going to show a close-up of this diagram with the focal mechanisms. I think on the, well, I think you remember that, uh, oh, here, here is the key. Thrust is, thrust events are with this kind of beach ball pattern. And you can see these are dominantly thrust events. Let's look closer. Okay, now you see it very well. 
So for Ralph Archuleta, the uh, megathrust surface is right there offshore Sumatra. There are, there are accelerometers out on those uh, Metali, uh, those islands, and there should be um, very strong earthquakes recorded at short distances from this Sumatra uh, subduction system. Lots of seismicity. Of course, the past events uh, are already have already gone by. The 9.1, 8.6, 8.6 uh, in Indian Ocean um, dominantly strike slip event, 8.2, 8.4, 7.9. Lots of lots of strong events with um, more undoubtedly uh, to come that can be can be recorded from the mega thrust. Uh, moving to the east, we'll look at cross sections H and G through Java. The seismicity is uh, de decreases. The four arc gets gets a bit larger, and we're going to look at uh, on the on the right left hand side will be G, and on the right hand side will be H. It's kind of reversed in the in the display. Okay, here we are with G cross section G and H. In this case, in H, I can say right away that the seismic tomography suggests that there's a detached slab, that there's a hole in the slab here, that this gap is not a continuous plate. Um, again, we've got every kind of earthquake that a strong motion seismologist could ever dream of, megathrust events, intraplate events, uh, crustal events, the fl these Flores events are uh, backhawk thrusting events. It's really very rich, rich data set. Let's look at the this Flores uh, thrust. Okay, thrust mechanism again looks like as shown here in the middle. And when I show you the focal mechanism for Flores, you'll recognize it. And there we are. This is the backhawk thrust on Flores Island, which uh, had a very damaging earthquake and created a large tsunami, has made, has historically has had many, many tsunamis. Uh, I should mention this, the source of this data. Uh, I'm a little bit late in acknowledging that. This is the global CMT uh, started by Adam Zawanski and Joran Ekstrom. Um, uh, the CMT catalog solutions, which uh, I have compared with solutions uh, provided by BMKG, and they are in very good agreement. As you know, these are made with uh, not on the fly, they're carefully done and um, are checked, and they're mainly based on the long period data, so global data is uh, reliable to get it. The earthquakes that I'm plotting are from the USGS catalog. So here is um, cross section through Java and uh, showing showing the seismicity as a function of depth with uh, with a gap uh, in the in the middle right here. We're looking looking right at that big seismicity gap. Okay, I, I want to end fairly soon. I don't want to speak for a long time. Uh, there is also active source marine geophysics data that shows this subduction system and tells us what's going on. Um, the, these data were collected about a decade ago by the German research institution in Kiel uh, called Geomar, Geomarine. And let's take a look at some of their data. So you can see the subducting Indian Ocean plate right here. This is the megathrust boundary. And there are splay faults that come up into the four arc crust. So you have shallow four arc seismicity as well as mega thrust seismicity. The plate boundary is very clearly, uh, clearly imaged. This has been confirmed by seismic refraction. And I, I took away a lot, of, a lot of slides because of the time limitation. But this is a well studied region. So it's a region where we know about the shallow crust 
from reflection profiles. We know the velocity structure from refraction, and we know the geometry of the plate from tomography. So let's just uh, kind of wrap up this brief tour of uh, the seismicity of Indonesia by looking at cross section F, F prime, going through Timor and into the Banda Sea. This is a different tectonic setting because we have continental, a continental margin of Australia being subducted at the Timor trough. This is Australia down here. And it's not ocean crust. We, it's not an oceanic subduction system. It's a continental subduction system, one of the very few. So here, here's the uh, area, the previously subducted oceanic crust is way down here at, at depths of 400 to 600. The slab appears to um, flatten and uh, we have a continent ocean collision zone at the surface and with deep lithospheric folding. So here's the uh, seismicity of the Banda Sea with like a bathtub with the subduction zone wrapping around in a U-shaped and uh, very interesting seismicity pattern. So the Timor collision that I was just talking about, I think I'll end with this, is a collision between the Australian continental margin and that uh, subduction zone. The oceanic lithosphere has already been consumed. If you go to the island of Timor, here, here's the island of Timor, you'll see uh, a lot of folded sediments, and you can actually see some of the uh, thrust boundaries where the carbonate rocks on from the uh, from the uh, Australian plate carbonate rocks have been uh, overthrust on each other and duplexed. Australia going down, quantifying continental subduction during arc continent accretion in Timor. Great paper. Um, in geo. So this is the structure on the island. It's all these shallow marine carbonates being scraped off at the, at the subducting trench. Here's the subducting Australian plate, but the sediments are very light. They don't want to go down. So they, they um... so here's the picture. The seismicity is in this plate, the Australian uh, lithosphere. And up at the surface, the Timor fold and thrust belt is being scraped off. All these, all these sediments on the incoming plate, the Australian incoming plate, are uh, being uh, preserved at the surface while the uh, mafic rocks subduct to great depth. Subduction of continental crust and mantle in this region. Um, Final slide, I'll end with a comparison with uh, the structure in Taiwan to the north. We've just jumped from Indonesia to straight north to Taiwan. You can see in a very well studied region that similar complex tectonics takes place with um, subduction in occurring in, in multiple directions. So it's giving an abundant and very rich uh, source of earthquake data for uh, the creation of uh, ground motion ground motion models. And I think I'll just jump to say thank you very much. And back to you, Madonna. Yeah, thank you very much, Walter, for your uh, material. So uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to directly uh, discussion uh, discuss uh, discussion time. So please, uh, anyone, if you have a question, so maybe if you can, if you have a question, I provide uh, to me uh, to me thought. So, oh, maybe if you want to directly, so I give you permission to open your uh, your microphone. So if you want to uh, share. Um, and directly say maybe may you can uh, type uh, type down in uh, Zoom chat. 
So I think we have a question from. Yes, go ahead. Mbak Mbak Indri, Mbak Indri, please. Okay, thank you, Mbak Donna. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Muni, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you very clearly and uh, hear you very well. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, excuse me, uh, can you share about your Javanese, uh, Java Island uh, subduction zone? Java Island, yes, let me, it will take me just a minute to, to get to the correct slide. So give me, please be patient uh, for a minute. Okay. Okay, so let's see, uh, that was Java Island is later. I'm getting there, we're getting close. Uh, how about that? Okay, yes, uh, excuse me, uh, first uh, I couldn't, uh, on my cam because uh, my connection is not stable. And I would like to ask about the subduction zone beneath the Java Island. We know yeah. that the angle of the subduction zone from the West Java to the East Java uh, becomes steeper. So what is your opinion if there is an earthquake uh, in the boundary of the Central Java and the East Java? Thank you, Mr. Wani. Okay, yes, um, you have a very good point that uh, if you have a change of um, subducting plate geometry, there could be a, a fault, there could be a tear, there could be some structure within the subducting plate, and uh, this would make it more likely to have seismicity, it could generate a uh, a, actually a, 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 a normal fault. Um, so I think that looking carefully at the geometry of the subducting plate between West Java, Central Java and East Java would be very would be a very good idea. Um, let me take a look. I want to see uh, how many deep earthquakes there are there. I did, the deep earthquakes are in, I hope someone remembers where, I don't remember my own talk, uh, wh where I put things. Oh my goodness. I'm trying to see, hold on a second. I had the focal mechanism diagram. Uh, hold on. I think this might be it. Yeah, here we are. I found it. That wasn't too bad. I've taken longer. So, um, Beneath Java, there are deep earthquakes. So yeah, the slab uh, is is got deep seismicity uh, throughout the whole island, beneath the whole island, quite different than Sumatra. Um, but I think we cannot, if you're wondering if, if this means that there is a greater earthquake hazard, I think we cannot say that it's a greater greater hazard but it's capable of having large earthquake for sure. Thank you for your question. Okay, thank you very much for the answer. Okay, thank you very much for uh, the Indri. Anyone? Oh, please, uh, Pak Aris Karudianta. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mbak Dona. <laughs> For the uh, yeah, uh, actually, um, my question is is uh, still connect with the Baindri question regarding the uh, deep earthquake uh, in the Java, especially uh, there is in the story of uh, earthquake in Java. Java is uh, some uh, there is a frontal earthquake in the northern part of Java. Uh, categorized as deep earthquake uh, with the depth more than 400 kilo, but it, it felt and also uh, the impact is uh, on the weight scale uh, from Jakarta until Surabaya, uh, like in Indramayu uh, 2007, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, what do you think uh, is regarding the, uh, the hazard 
the uh, the hazard uh, the earthquake hazard the seismicity hazard uh, as and again the especially for the development of ground motion prediction equation uh, do we need uh, uh, a, uh, uh, we do do we need to uh, to to use uh, this kind of yeah. earthquake or not because uh, well as you know uh, mostly most of the big city uh, in Java is uh, located in the basin area like Surabaya, Semarang, uh, Yogyakarta, uh, Jakarta itself. And right now uh, in all the big cities is high rise building. And we, uh, especially me, I, I, I'm worried with the high rise building that will be affected with long period uh, wave. And of course, for deep, for the deep earthquake, it will be uh, possibly uh, has a high high energy in yeah. the uh, right. So, what do you think? At uh, least we need to because it's like uh, my question before uh, to Parker, Miss Parker, that uh, in the busy hydro, there is only. Uh, the ground motion only uh, uh, only 300 kilometer, I think. When 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 the, the depth in, in in the northern part is more than 400 kilo. What do you think? Okay, so um, I don't think it's necessary for me to go back and show once again. I think everyone remembers that. The deep earthquakes can go down as deep as 660 kilometers. Uh, and in uh, Java, in some sections, very deep intra-slab events occur. So I would like to throw the ball over to Grace Parker and ask her, do we need to worry about deep earthquakes? Or uh, can we just focus on the shallow megathrust events and make our life simpler and easier? Well, I think um, I can only speak for certain about kind of the moderate depth, right? Like up to about 200 kilometer deep slab earthquakes, because that's only what I've worked with. Okay. Um, and I think, right, 200, um, like I showed in that earthquake early warning sensitivity surface at short periods, the increased energy from those deep earthquakes can kind of outweigh or be larger than the increased attenuation from the, the depth, the distance caused by uh, how deep they are. So they can sometimes have more short period energy. Right. Um, but you're asking about the long period energy in the basins, right? And I think, uh, you know, if, if you're about 200 kilometers from the earthquake and it's very large, right? It could probably generate enough long period ground motions in your basin to affect your buildings. When you get to 600 kilometers depth, that was gonna be my question to Walter. Do you think earthquakes of 600 kilometers depth affect the seismic hazard? I don't know the answer to that question. Well, let's, uh, uh, Jim, and Jim it looks like, raised, yeah, Jim maybe Moore he has some. Jump in. Uh, go ahead, jump in, Jim, and we'll Actually, uh, this is, get a debate going. This is uh, sort of different, so why don't you continue with that? I'm, it's a little bit different question, kind of related, but it's not directly related. Yeah, okay, so I would just agree with what Grace has said. Uh, we can remember the 2007 uh, Padang earthquake uh, beneath uh, Sumatra. Uh, it had a depth of about uh, uh, 80 kilometers, very enriched in high frequency, extremely damaging because the buildings were vulnerable to 10 Hertz. The energy just went right up the slab and it was efficiently uh, propagated. And um, it was remarkable how much, how much damage was caused by an earthquake that deep. Um, now, I don't think an earthquake at 600 kilometer, I don't know of any example of a 600 kilometer deep earthquake 
causing a fatality, but uh, it so is possible. Um, yeah. I don't either, but I also haven't gone searching. But right. um, but Grace, I can assure you, there's there's plenty of earthquakes between you know 50 and 200, the, the depth that yeah. we've been looking at. And those certainly have the potential to, yeah. uh, to be to have uh, to be hazardous. So what do you got, Jim? Um, you didn't mention tsunami earthquakes at all. And you know, over the last 20, 30 years, there's been uh, at least two magnitude 7.5 tsunami earthquakes. So what do you do with those? I mean, as Grace said, maybe they produce long period motion. So you might want to include them in your attenuation relations. But if you include them in your attenuation relations, the short periods are really going to get messed up. So how do you deal with those? If you want to calculate probabilities of earthquakes and ground motion, I think you have to include them. But they're going to just really throw a, a, a monkey yeah. wrench into the, the value. So well, how do you deal with the tsunami earthquakes? So let me just uh, repeat for everyone who's listening, uh, what is a tsunami earthquake? In, uh, in about 1994, there was an earthquake in Nicaragua that was recorded by a broadband seismometer. And it, it was a slow, slow, had a slow rupture. So it didn't cause any high frequency shaking, but it did cause a lot of displacement at the uh, seafloor. And um, the interpretation was carried out by Hiro Kanamori and showed that it had a, a high oh. moment and it, it generated, indeed, it generated a strong tsunami, but you couldn't feel it and you couldn't even record it on a short period network, pretty much. So these um, tsunami earthquakes are uh, oh. slow rupture events and they do occur, as Jim has said, in, um, in Indonesia. Now, your, what was your question? What are we going to do about them? I mean, we, uh, we, there are broadband stations, but I think... Um, but do, you include, way... do you include them in your calculations of probabilities and in terms of the, the attenuation relations? Or do you just throw them out and say, we don't want to hear about that? <laughs> Oh my God! Yeah. Um, <laughs> use, a, also. use a mixed effects grouping factor. Yeah. Mixed effects grouping account for them. Factor. Yeah, account for them. You know, so that they're separate in your regression. Yeah. Uh, 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 Professor Muni and uh, yeah. Dr. Parker. Yeah, I think my question is similar with Jis uh, Mori, uh, Professor Jis Mori. That uh, yeah, in Java we have we have experience from the uh, tsunami earthquake, as you know, 2006 Pangandaran, 1994 Banyuwangi tsunami. All is this uh, tsunami earthquake with slow rupture, and of course, uh, as I know, as uh, Parker said that uh, in ground motion prediction equation. I think it, it will be through <laughs> this kind of a long period uh, effect. But uh, again, uh, science the science the the development of city of Indonesia in Indonesia that uh, sometimes is not really uh, thinking about the, the seismic hazard and all the city in Indonesia the big city I mean in very deep basin like in Jakarta. More with with more than seven hundred meter depth of basin. I don't know. Maybe in the northern part is more than under, uh, one kilo. Uh, it's very very dangerous. I mean, it, yeah, not dangerous. Um, yeah, I don't know. In the long period it will be affect also for me. So how we we deal with 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 this kind of of uh, uh, possibility? Uh, in the future, because well, um, if we're talking about the the record uh, in Java, I think we have more than 300 sensor, uh, both uh, broadband and also the astral graph. And some area like the western part of Java uh, is also occupied by uh, the MEMS. So I think it's around 
400 sensor right now in western part of Java. I think this is uh, in the future, on the near future, it will be abundant of data. So I hope that, yeah, I don't know. We, we don't know exactly in, in BMKG how to, uh, to uh, uh, yeah, to analyze or to, to make all the data useful uh, for the mitigation and the sensitive yeah. mitigation. Yeah, so some of your uh, accelerometers are MEM solid state sensors, and some of them are actual accelerometers. It's a mixture, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we, we have right now in, in I, I, I not remember all Java in, Java, all in the Java area, but in the Western part of Java, we have around uh, 230 for broadband, and uh, force balance, astrograph, and around 90, uh, not 90, maybe 140 MEMS. In Jakarta right. itself is, we have 50, 50 MEMS and several uh, broadband and FBA astrograph. And the, the MEMS are also used for earthquake early warning, is that right? Uh, not really, not really only maps, but we right now still still in the trial trial yeah. phase uh, yeah. to using this uh, as a, a quickly warning. But it's still again still trial trial phase because we not yet to publish. Okay, thank you. Just one one comment. Um, I realize it's a difficult problem, but. For example, if you want to calculate long-term probabilities, like a hazard map, I think you have to include those earthquakes because they are apparently are real intraplate events on the interface. So if yeah. you're adding up moment or adding up big earthquakes, then you have to include the tsunami earthquakes as a, right. a regular earthquake. But then if you include it as a regular earthquake, the ground motions are very small. So do you include that very small ground motion into your long-term <laughs> probability yeah. or not. For, for, for your information, uh, just last week, uh, we have a, a cluster of, uh, we, we call it swamp earthquake in the eastern part of Java. Uh, is uh, It's just close to the area from the 1994 tsunami, Banyuwangi tsunami is the biggest magnitude is only 5.4 if not i here, here uh, also uh, pak makmuri or pak jati that maybe uh, join to the join to the zoom uh, con, uh, could you correct me this uh, the swamp earthquake it seems uh, the indicator of slow sleep even in that area because is we have several several cluster um, like last year also we have similar similar thing about this like because this is uh, the magnitude is similar and it consists for one week or like sixty or seventy uh, small earthquake so I think this is like. Uh, Pak Jimori mentioned it. In the future, we need to, uh, yeah, uh, to use this kind of also uh, if we're talking about the hazard in the future. Thank you. Okay. So, Pajati, do you want to uh, make confirm, uh, confirmation or maybe comment about the Pariska statement? <clears throat> okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, I have a question. So, if you, if we look at the the fall along along in the uh, Java Island, so. Is there any continuation between the Flores Fault and the Kandang Fault? 
is there any continuation con, uh, continuation between the four uh, Flores fall and the Canning falls? Is it possible, uh, Dr. Walter? Yes, yes, yeah. I think uh, in uh, is uh, is it possible there's uh, any continuation between Flowers Fall and Canning Falls? There's something maybe uh, there's any fall uh, from uh, uh, cause uh, yeah. yeah. Cause. Sorry, I had I had my mute. I was talking with my mute on. Uh, here's I think you can see my screen. Here is the Flor Flores Fault and the Kendane Fault, and you can see it looks like there can be a continuation. It's yes, I believe it's possible. Mm, okay. The, uh, today or in the last twenty years, the uh, Kendane thrust has been quiet. But, um, but many earth many faults are quiet for more than twenty years. So these could this could become active again. Right now, the Flores thrust has been active for many decades. Good question. Yeah, uh, I think yes, it's possible. Okay, okay, thank you. So uh, we have a question uh, from the uh, Zoom chat uh, from Quart uh, Ferina. So in the in Sunda Strait, there has an Krakatau volcano, which increasing active in recently time. In uh, 2080, this activity caused a tsunami. And my question is: there any possibility that a quick event near volcano can trigger high activity of volcano? What is your opinion? Okay, here, here we can see this this region that we're talking about uh, exactly here, and uh, a lot of earthquakes are nearby. Um, uh, usually, uh, earthquakes. It's only it's rare that an earthquake will actually be proven to trigger a volcano. It may trigger some activity, but of course, my volcanoes are magmatically driven. Uh, in my opinion, the local earthquakes are not very likely. It's very unlikely for them to to trigger a uh, strong volcanic activity. But I'd like to give Jim Mori a chance to uh, to state his opinion. Go ahead, Jim. Um, I basically agree with that. There's a lot of stories of uh, earthquakes and volcanoes, but you know, every place that there's lots of volcanoes, there's also lots of earthquakes. So I think some of those could be just sort of coincidence. Um, the most at least in Japan, the most well-known example is in 1707, uh, a few weeks after the last, not the last, but one of the big Nankai earthquakes, Fuji, Mount well, Fuji erupted. So there do seem to be some cases, but in general, I don't think we've seen good evidence for earthquakes triggering eruptions or even triggering much, you know, subsurface magma movement. I mean, sometimes we see earthquakes trigger some volcanic earthquakes, which are usually pretty small. But as you said, I don't think there's any really strong evidence that earthquakes re uh, regularly would trigger volcanic eruptions. But Indonesia well, is, a is a place to look for that. And actually, I, I did right. spend some time after the, um, uh, the Aceh earthquake, because there were several volcanoes that began, became erupt, erupt, began to erupt uh, sort of a few months after that event. And I kind of looked all up and down the Indonesia coast and it was unconclusive. <laughs> there seemed to be some interesting stories, but, uh, or interesting correlations. But like I said, there's always lots of earthquakes and always lots of volcanoes. So it's, it's hard to make any kind of clear uh, conclusions about that. Well, also, I'm showing now these, the, all the earthquakes uh, off of Sumatra, starting with, of course, 2004, 9.1. And we can refer to the Tohoku event, uh, which also failed to trigger 
of a volcanic eruption in Japan in uh, 2010. It did trigger seismicity under Fuji though. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I mentioned that there is a trick, there is some unrest can be triggered, but not, uh, and I wasn't aware, I wasn't aware anyway of a full blown eruption. So I think it's not very likely. I think the volcano has its own mechanism that it follows. Okay, thank you very much for Dr. Walter and uh, Professor James Mori. Yeah, yeah, excuse me, <laughs> maybe uh, because we have the retraction uh, time. So I think it's uh, very late in your place, yeah, Dr. Walter. Oh, it's so, okay. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's sleeping time. It's 10 o'clock at night, yeah. <laughs> Okay, but but uh, I give you maybe uh, the 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 slide uh, uh, the maybe the little time for you if you have a uh, any question uh, for at uh, this session, please go ahead if you have. So I give you a question to deliver uh, directly, or maybe do you want to type down in the Zoom chat? So uh, as for myself, I, I don't have any uh, administrative or other questions. And I think this is the last session with uh, Dr. Grace Parker uh, tomorrow. Ooh. She may join, uh, but she's not a speaker tomorrow. You're welcome to be there. Do you have any last comments, uh, Grace? Okay, okay, please, please. Just thank you for having me. It's been... Um really great to participate in this. And I think I probably will call in tomorrow. I'm interested in uh, site response, of course. So um, great. you'll Love see me you. in the Zoom, yeah. And I hope Jim, maybe Jim, if you have time, you can join tomorrow as well. Uh, well, you're a speaker tomorrow, I think. Yeah, I have to uh, give a talk, I guess. <laughs> yeah, right, that's right. I, I wasn't looking at the program. <laughs> it's getting late here. You're number, <laughs> you're, you're the uh, second speaker. Okay, okay. Uh, maybe uh, time is over. <laughs> so I think it's okay. I think, yeah, we yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, we will continue on tomorrow. So thank you very much for our speaker, the thousand hour speaker. Thank you very much for Professor James Mori. Thank you very much for Dr. Grace Parker. And also thank you very much for Dr. Walter Mooney for your. A uh, nice uh, presentation. So maybe we can meet again uh, tomorrow in the at eight o'clock uh, exactly. So I think uh, tomorrow is the last uh, last day of the training. So maybe right. tomorrow. So you, uh, I hope uh, uh, you all uh, participant um, make preparation because tomorrow time uh, to conduct. Uh, post uh, assign uh, uh, post assignment examination <laughs> something like that. So um, thank you very much for all and uh, thank you I, everyone. Yeah, I do mistake if thank I everyone. yeah I do apologize if I have a mistake during uh, during a learning. So yeah. thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. Terima kasih banyak semuanya.